Hey there students, Mark here, and today we're here in Turks and Caicos, a very windy Turks and Caicos. The trade winds make this a great place so you don't bake in the sun. You do fry in the sun, but you don't bake in the sun. And the thing is, today what I want to talk about is some of the reasons why companies actually develop new products. And the thing is, is in general, if you think about it, most companies are probably developing new products in order to make more money. I mean, obviously, that's the biggest thing out there. And I'm not, but I'm not going to talk about that. What I want to talk about today are kind of four kind of underlying things in the background that kind of inspire companies in order to make new products or new services and things like that, okay? Now, the first thing I want to talk about is actually fashion cycles that are out there. I mean, trends change, don't they? I mean, we don't wear the same clothes we used five years ago or 10 years ago. The movies that are popular now weren't popular 20 years ago. There's things that change over time and companies have to adjust to that. We have to adjust to those changes changes okay if you look at it in terms of movies right now superheroes are all the rage and you're gonna have a Superman a spider-man and Avengers and all this kind of stuff but before that what was the big thing we had oh there was the vampires right with Twilight and there was true blood on TV and things like that and before that oh there was the zombies right you had um, you know 28 days later and and uh, the Walking Dead and all these kind of things oh but what was before that oh there was the dystopian future right with only the young people can change the world you know like the maze runner and hunger games and stuff like that and then before that what was there oh there are all the 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 magic and wizardry of harry potter and lord of the rings and before that oh it was all about disaster movies you know like twister which was about you know twisters about you know tornadoes we had titanic right biggest box biggest blockbuster movie at the time all kinds of stuff and so we see the things cycle through and eventually people get tired of you know the disaster movies they got tired of the vampire movies eventually get tired of the superhero movies and the thing is we always have to be looking at how are things changing what do we need to switch to okay and so companies do that and that's why they might be developing new products just to kind of take advantage of those changes in society and those changes in trends i mean honestly you ever wonder why you laugh so hard at those throwback thursday pictures your parents put up on facebook and stuff like that because you're like yeah that's hilarious to look at now mom but hey you know what your mom looked pretty cool back in the 90s so don't give her too much gruff okay now the second thing that actually can inspire companies to come up with new products is changing customers' needs, okay? The thing is, is customers' needs change over time. It could be driven by technology. It could be driven by where they are in their life and things like that. I mean, think about it. Right now, you know, I'm a father. I got two kids. I got a wife. I got a mortgage. I got stuff like that. So the products I need are different than what it was when I was 20 years old. And the only thing I thought about was, hey, where can I go travel and where can I get my next beer, you know? There's different things you need. And so so companies have to adjust to that because their customers needs change okay so for example at a university if we see how students lives has changed over time well now what you see is oh well we're doing more online classes that's available for us so students that can study abroad they can take a class at their home university online while they're in Barcelona or they're in Vienna or, or Australia or wherever they can do that and so we make these products in order to take advantage of that to help out our customers in these new segments of their lives and that's why it's always good to track kind of the macro factors that are out there you know is there any legal changes because political changes society changes you know cultural changes demographic changes these kind of things we might want to look into those things in order making new products okay so the next thing you want to look at in terms of ways that kind of get, inspire companies to come up with new products is sometimes they realize that they've actually they have market saturation they can't sell any more of their current product than they're already selling I mean think about it McDonald's can't sell more any more cheeseburgers right so I mean you got cheeseburgers at lunch you got cheeseburgers at dinner you got cheeseburgers at two o'clock in the morning I, I can't do any more cheeseburgers right and so what they might do is like look how can we sell more stuff how can we get more things out there because I can't sell any more cheeseburgers well they'll come up with a new product maybe a chicken McNugget right so the McNuggets came out you don't want a burger hey now we can get you when you want some chicken we can have something there because I just can't sell any more at that area and if you look at certain companies they've actually seen that hey we've saturated our market maybe we sell new products at different times of the day have you ever had Taco Bell for breakfast well Taco Bell realized look we've sold all we can at lunch dinner and late night so what can we do what's left well we're not selling anything at breakfast 
why, why don't we try something new? And so they came out with a whole Taco Bell breakfast just for that market because they'd saturated the rest of the day with all their tacos and burritos and chalupas and things like that, okay? And then the fourth kind of way you might look at in terms of why they might be developing new products is actually sometimes it's just managing risk. You're trying to expand your portfolio. I mean, think about it. If I only sell one kind of product, well, what happens when people stop buying that product? We go out of business. So maybe I sell not just one, maybe two or three or four different products. So maybe this product is doing well, this one's not doing okay so well, you know, and they kind of balance each other out. So it kind of spreads our risk out a bit more. And so those are some reasons you might look at it in terms of why companies actually might be developing new products. I mean, but it really goes back a lot of times just to making more money. But I want to give you those four ideas out there to help you to think about kind of the why behind it. Okay, because I mean, there's also, you could also get their competition might come up with something and all this other stuff but kind of some inherent ways why companies come up with new products are those four things so i hope that helps if you want to learn more click that subscribe button don't forget to hit the notification bell we'll have more marketing videos to help out marketing students like yourself or youtube videos to help people with their own youtube channel all kinds of things like that anyway i'll say bye from here in turks and caicos and uh, i'm going to invest in some better sunblocks next time so maybe a company can make one that works really really well um you know at high sun altitude and you're just uh, it just hurts bye Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're going to talk about where new ideas for new products come from. Because a lot of people just think, oh, a new idea just poof, pops in your mind. And, and actually, yes, yeah, sometimes that actually happens. And sometimes you actually have it in your company where you actually have it specifically designed to do that. It's called brainstorming, right? I mean, we've all done it in our old English lit classes, right? Let's brainstorm some ideas for a project. Well, companies will do that too. They will brainstorm for ideas for new products. So you can get it that way. The idea though is if you're going to use that as a way to come up with new products you got to make sure you give people the time and the energy and the money and the the support to brainstorm and come up with other ideas okay and so that could be one of those things hey it just poofs pops on our brain we have that but the other thing you might want to look at is sometimes you have an internal research and development like wing and that's their whole job to come up with new products i mean if you look at restaurant chains they have people that are just out there developing a new way to make a sandwich what's going to be a better way do we go bun burger cheese ketchup or is it bun cheese ketchup burger what are we going to do and that internal research and development team is figuring out new products gillette apple they have their own kind of internal teams that come up with that research and do that for them okay now, sometimes though, we might actually not have it within our own company or just in our own company. We might have what's called a consortium or a research and development consortium or research and development group that actually a group of people come together to come up with a lot of different ideas. It's kind of like when you hear about a writer's room for a movie series. Like, oh, we've got like 10 or 12 writers together to come up with a bunch of new ideas for new Transformers movies or new Star Wars movies or, or new Marvel movies, right? So it's this big group that's come in and just throwing out ideas and yes some will work with our business for our marvel movies and some may work for pixar and some may work for this but it's a group that's really set up to share lots of ideas about a lot of different kinds of new developments as opposed to just under one specific focus brand okay whereas you do with the internal research and development now another thing you can do if you're looking to develop new products is you might see there's a perfectly good product out there already well, why don't I just license it? Why, why should I develop something when I can just sell somebody else's stuff instead? You can do that. And sometimes you'll see that internationally. You'll see a product that looks great. I mean, if you go to Australia, Tim Tams, oh my gosh, there's these like chocolate candies with chocolate coating. It's like if a, a fudge round and an Oreo had a baby, it would be like this, but then they have an Australian accent. It'd be so fantastic and just awesome. And, and you're like, wow, why don't we make our own version of that? Well, why, why would we do that? Why don't we just license the Tim Tam brand and we just make it here? And so that's what you'll see some companies do. They'll just license it from another company and sell it here. That's why sometimes you'll see products when you travel around the world, you're like, wait a minute, that's, that's called something else back home. Yeah, it is because we license it differently or they have a different product. They might change the brand name because it fits better in that market, but you can license it. Now, another thing I think is really important when you're trying to develop a new product is really listen to your customers. Look, customer input is probably the best way to come up with new products because your customers that are already spending money on your products are telling you, hey, you know what would be cool if you could make this? 
Well, don't you think it's going to be a better chance it's going to be a success if you make exactly what they ask for? Yes, you can get ideas from them. That's why it's so important in marketing to listen to the needs and wants of your customers because then you can deliver products and services that they need, that they want, and that's going to be a perfect new product to develop, okay? And then the last one I want to talk about is how you can actually look at your competitors and your competitors' products can give you ideas. If you look at airlines, you know, the, the Deltas, Americans, and Uniteds, they all came out with these basic economy fares because they learned from their Spirit, Southwest, Allegiant competition, having those dirt cheap prices, people are willing to pay a really cheap flight for getting nothing special. Hey, we could come up with that product ourselves, huh? We could do that. Hey, how many burger places have you been to that have their own version of the Big Mac? Right? You learn from that, hey, that's actually kind of a good idea. Look at all the smartphones out there. Doesn't it feel like, well, all the smartphones kind of make you feel like it's just an iPhone kind of clone. Yeah, because they were inspired by their competition. They were inspired by Apple. And so you can look at that. And the thing is, there's so many different ways you can come up with new ideas for your products that this is just a really short list. But I wanted to give you some ideas of where those ideas come from, all right? So when you look at a product you see, a new product you see, you know, tomorrow, look and they go, huh, I wonder where that came from. Where did those gluten-free Rice Krispies come from? Was it they saw the competition had gluten-free Cheerios? Was it because their, their, their people, their customers were asking for it? Is it because they were trying to think of what's a new Rice Krispie we could have? Hey, there's a lot of different ways those new products can come about. So I hope this helps you know a few of the ways that new products do pop up in the world. If you want to learn more, we got more videos to help you out learning about new kinds of ways you can do new product development. Anyway, I wish you all the best and bye. Hey there new product marketers, Mark here. And today we're here on Turks and Caicos, beautiful set of islands here on the Atlantic. It's just gorgeous here. And it really makes me think is, what are some new products I could sell so I could live here? And it got me thinking, what are the type of products that actually companies do come up with or new types of products that are out there? Because a lot of times everyone thinks, oh, this new product, it's something no one has seen before, which in reality is not necessarily the case. So we're gonna kind of go through here or just kind of the new product categories that are out there that you can use and kind of think of to think of what are some new products we could make for our firm or we can make for our business or whatever and the thing is when people think of new products a lot of times they think to what we call new to the world products something that's never been there before no our product is going to be something completely different okay well here's the thing most of the time those new to the world products that you think are new to the world aren't actually new to the world. They've already been invented. They're already out there. The iPhone, it wasn't the first smartphone, okay? There was other cars out there. The Model T Ford was not the first car out there, okay? And so what I want you to think about is realize that yes, there are new to the world products. The very first app that was out there, the very first, you know, computer and things like that, those did happen. But most of the time we're coming up with new products. What we're really doing is we're coming up with new to the firm products. These things that our company has never made before. So like when, the, when um, Microsoft, came out with the Xbox. That was a new to the firm product. Or when Apple came out with their iPhone the first time, that was a new to the product, uh, new to the company product, okay? So it's a little bit different. So you wanna kind of think about that. Now, another thing you might see is sometimes a new product line or a new product they come out with is just kind of a, an addition to an existing product line. So Kellogg's, Kellogg's has thousands, well not thousands, but it feels like there's thousands of different cereals they actually put out there. And so kind of an addition to that existing product line might be they come up with you know cocoa crispies with marshmallows in it or maybe they come out with you know there's one I saw recently which was a peeps like this Easter candy themed cereal so it is a new product but it's a new product in terms of an existing line they already have and that's where a lot of companies really come so you think about Nintendo the switch the Wii U the Wii those are just new additions to the product lines they already have of gaming units right so you have that now another similar thing you might see is what we call an improvement of an existing product so this might be maybe it's more efficient or maybe um, you have for example now with extra vitamin D you know you have some food that might have some kind of extra thing in it maybe now with extra caffeine or a Red Bull Plus or something like that you can have those kind of new products all right now the thing is though a lot of times for companies when they do come up with new products sometimes the reason why they do the new products 
is to help them reposition themselves into a new market or reposition their brand. So head and shoulders. Now, when you think of head and shoulders, you think, oh, I see head and shoulders in the shower. They must have hand, they must have dandruff, right? Well, I know the first time that I went to my shower and I saw there was head and shoulder body wash, I'm like, wait a minute, do I have body dandruff? I don't know what's going on. No, you don't have body dandruff. The thing is, is Head & Shoulders came out with a body wash to help reposition themselves. So they're not just the dandruff shampoo, they're kind of like the body cleaning kind of stuff. And so they use that kind of reposition their products. Now another product, kind of new product category you might see is companies might come out with a cost reduction kind of product. So for example, Mercedes, we think of Mercedes, we think of those fancy S-Class and E-Class cars, right? Like, oh my gosh, those are so cool. The thing is though, they came out with a cost reduce model, the A-Class or the M-Class or the G-Class. These are cheaper versions of their current products, a cost reduction version to give them a whole new market, okay? So that can be another thing. Other things you might look at, maybe you like the Marvel Cinematic Universe, you'll see they have those big movies, but also they have cartoons, they also have TV shows. Well, those are actually cost reduction new products because I can't afford $250 million investments into a bunch of movies, but I can afford maybe $10 million to develop a, a, you know, a, a cartoon series on Spider-Man or a cartoon series on Guardians of the Galaxy or something like that. So you have those different things. And the thing is, there's a lot of different kind of product categories out there for new products, but I just want to kind of give you those. So when you're thinking of developing new products for your company or your product lines and stuff like that, you have an idea where they fit. Anyway, I hope this helps. If you want to learn more, do subscribe to our channel, hit that notification bell so you get all of our new marketing videos and YouTube advice videos out there on our Professor Walters channel. And do we do wish you a great day marketing or trying new products or developing your own. And if you are a student learning, hey, give us a like to let us know that we helped another student study for an exam. Bye from Turks and Caicos. Hey there, fellow marketers. Are you thirsty for some market information? Well, today what we're gonna talk about is competitive positioning in the market. You know, the Cokes versus Pepsis kind of stuff. Where do firms sit in the whole competitive nature of their industry? And the thing is, you always have a market leader. That's the product that has the largest market share. They command the market. They kind of set the trends and stuff like that in the fizzy drink industry, if you will, like Coca-Cola does. But the thing is, you usually have a number two, like a Pepsi, that's always challenging. And they're called the market challenger, okay? And so they're gonna be trying hard to catch up. That's why you'll see like a lot of times Coke has the same kind of commercials year over year, more of a traditional setting. Whereas Pepsi is always trying to innovate with new commercials, a lot of new flavors, trying new things out to help improve their market share so they can become number one. And in some markets, Pepsi is number one, okay? So you kind of think about that. But in general, you have your market leader, then you have your market challenger. But the thing is, we don't just drink Coca-Cola and Pepsi. There's other competitive people out there in the market. And that's why you have what are called market followers. So if you're going to Walmart and you get your Sam's Club soda, your Sam's Club cola, right? That's a market follower. They're just in the market, just following along. I'll just do what Coke does or Pepsi does. I see that the cola sells well for them. We'll have our own cola. We'll have our own orange soda and things like that. And the market follower, their whole thing is they're trying not to get noticed. Like, look, we're just taking the rest of the market that you're not going for Coke because Coke wants to sell this for $1.50 and they don't want to sell it for 50 cents. But RC, they might come in there. Sam's Club might come in there as that market follower and sell at that lower price range. And the thing is, those market followers, they really don't want to cause any problems because if they cause problems, i.e. they're taking too much money away from the Cokes or the Pepsis, they might see that Coke might come out with, you know, Coca-Cola, economy, you know, a cheaper version of Coke or, or a Pepsi cheap, you know, a cheap version of that for a lower price point to take that market. So the market followers, they're really careful not to step on the toes of the market leaders, the market challengers. And the thing is, not everyone's going to be number one. Not everyone is going to go for number one. So you might have what are called market nichers. And market nichers would be like, you know, the Arnold Palmer iced tea and lemonade combination. They're not challenging Coke. They're not challenging Pepsi. They're going in that iced tea refresh drink niche they're just going right into there if you look at 
uh, things like Red Bull. Red Bull, they're only doing super caffeinated, keep you awake drinks, and they're just niche into that one thing because if you need to stay up late night to study for an exam or something, yeah, you could get a Coke or a Mountain Dew, but if you really want to stay awake, you get that Red Bull so you could party all night long or you can study all night long, right? And so they have that little niche there. And the thing is, those market niches, what they do is they see that, you know what? Those big time players, those market leaders, those market challengers, they're not really addressing that one market. So why don't we go to that niche and we'll become the de facto leader in that little niche there. Hence why Red Bull leads in those like highly caffeinated beverage kind of stuff. The Arizona iced teas and stuff like that, they're in the iced tea market, you know, where they're all, and then there's their all Palmer's kind of stuff. And they have that and they're just focusing on that one little niche. So they're not really threatening the Cokes because hey, look Coke, we're just focusing on iced tea. You go ahead and do your colas and orange sodas and clear sodas and stuff like that. We're just a nice mix of iced tea and lemonade. And so you have that. And so what you want to look at and see is where's our competitive position? Could we be a market leader or a market challenger? Or are we just the follower trying to like copycat off the, what the, the leaders are doing and learn from them? Or do we find our little niche out there and say, this is what we're going to go for. We're going to be this niche specific brand focusing on these people. So I hope that helps you know the difference between a market leader, a market challenger, a market follower, and a market nicher. Yes. So market leader, market challenger, market follower, and market nicher. It's been a long day and it's like 95 degrees. So I am going to have myself a little bit of an all in Palmer uh, to cool down on this hot day. So anyway. if you want to learn a little bit more about marketing or business, go ahead and subscribe to our channel. Give us a like. We really appreciate it and have a great time studying for your exam or whatever reason you're watching this video on market leaders, market challengers, market followers, and market nichers. Bye. Hey there fellow marketing students, Mark here. And today we're here at Grace Bay in Turks and Caicos, a beautiful place to be. And the thing is what we're gonna talk about today is actually when companies develop new products or they're thinking about developing new products, they wanna ask themselves, do I think this is gonna be a success? Because you might have ideas for new products, but if you're not sure if it's gonna work or if it's really gonna be a, a really booming success, you might decide, you know what? I'm not gonna try this new product out. And so what we're gonna go through today are four different ways you can kind of think about in order to deem if there's a good chance that our new product is gonna be a success, okay? And the first thing, and the one that kind of makes more sense if you think about it in a way is, is it a better product than what's already out there? I mean, if there's a relative advantage that people can see and notice on this new product versus what's already out there, of course, that's gonna be a better chance of success. I remember way back in the day when they used to show DVD versus VHS tapes, and you could see the superior sound quality, the superior visual quality, like, wow, that is just a better product. Yeah, if you build a better mousetrap, it's more likely to succeed. So that's the first thing, if you have that really good relative advantage over what's already out there. Because if you don't, why are people gonna switch to something they don't know if it's not a better deal or a better product? Now the second one I want to talk about we call is called compatibility. So is this new product you're developing or this new innovation you're developing, is it compatible? Does it work with the environment you're going to sell it in? Okay. One of the reasons I feel that Sweden and Finland were so good in the mobile phone technology in the beginning, you know, in the 90s and 80s and stuff like that, was because in those markets you had a huge country which was very sparsely populated in certain spots. So mobile phone technology really worked there because putting up one tower was a lot cheaper than running all those lines all over Lapland and stuff like that. And so it really kind of paid off. So if your product is coming out in a location where it works, it fits, it's going to do much better. I mean, that's why if you look at some of the, like the, the North faces and, 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 and Patagonia and stuff like that, you know, when they release these products, it fits into the market they're going for. Because if you're releasing, I mean, think about it. If I'm going to release a Portuguese brand of winter clothing, probably not going to work because Portugal is nice all year round or or Turks and Caicos winter wear. Well, this is Turks and, Co Turks and Caicos winter wear right here. It's not necessarily going to work because it doesn't fit with that market. So you might want to think about those things. Is it compatible? Now, the third one I'd say is if you look at it, we call it observability. Like, can people actually see the difference? Like, is it obvious? Again, going back to the DVD versus VHS tape or when it was when uh, HDTVs came out versus the old standard televisions, you could really see it. We could show people, look, you can see how much better it is. Look how crystal clear it is versus what you see before. I know for me, I remember I, they used to show a lot of sports when those HGTV shows came out. I'm like, oh my God, I can see the hockey puck. 
I, I can follow the soccer ball really easily. It's so much easier to see things. It's so much clearer. If people can see that, it's gonna make it a lot easier for people to, to, to kind of go for that new innovation. Now that observability really follows into our fourth thing, and that is, trialability and complexity of the new innovation. Look, the more complex an innovation is, the more complex a new product is, the less likely it's gonna succeed. If I need to watch a 30 minute video to understand how this product works versus a 30 second video, the 30 second video one is going to do a lot better job and sell a lot more than that 30 minute one, okay? The more complex a product is, the more you're gonna have a tough time selling it, all right? That's why sometimes what's nice is you might look at what's called trialability. How easy is it for people to try out that product and so sometimes what you'll see my biggest thing if you're looking at food at like Costco or, or, or a Sam's Club or something like that or your local grocery store they'll have people there that are like here try this food they have free samples why do they have the free samples because then you can test the food out because how are you gonna get people to try out your new peep cereal or your new meatball version and stuff like that you're not going to they're not gonna spend the money so what you do is you let them try it for free here just try the meatballs I know for me I love when it's like mom's weekend or dad's weekend at Costco or Sam's Club when it's a university town because the parents take all the students to Costco and the students are like running in with their friends and trying every different snack that's there it's hilarious but it works I know for me I mean I never thought of having Sam's Club meatballs I'm like that's Walmart meatballs why would I why would I get that well the thing was I was at Sam's Club and the lady was there she was very nice she's like here try one I'm like I'm okay she's like just try it I'm like all right I'm like oh wow that was that was really good I had a couple more and then I bought a couple bags I'm like wow I would never have bought that unless I tried it out and that's one of the things you got to realize is if you have a product that can be tried out that will like convert people it's a lot easier to get them to go for it than just ta saying take my word for it those meatballs taste good okay so I hope that helps you know for the different ways that you can kind of have an idea if like some factors that might affect if a new product is gonna be a success if uh, you want to learn more about marketing or new products or doing YouTube videos and stuff like that, please do click that subscription icon, do hit that notification bell, and you'll get our new business videos when we do put them out. Anyway, I wanna say thank you to all of you. Hope you click that like button and give us that thumbs up. Otherwise, I wish you good luck on your exams if you're studying, if you're a business person trying to figure out if you should go do a new product. I hope this helps you out as well, and we'll see you later in our next video. Bye from Turks and Caicos. Hey there, fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're on the Shetland Islands in Northern Scotland. And today we're gonna to talk about are the factors that influence the acceptance of innovations in an industry. Because there's some certain factors out there that we really have to think about and help, under, help us understand how quickly will our innovations be accepted or are there some big issues we're gonna have in getting people to buy in to our new products, our new ideas, our new innovations. And the first factor that I wanna talk about is the relative advantage. If the new product has a definite relative advantage over the previous product, it's more likely that an innovation is going to succeed. If you're making leaps and bounds changes, like if you're going from flip phone technology to smartphone technology, man, that is a much better phone. There's so much more I get out of it. There's so much more I can do with it. So of course, it's a better chance that innovation is going to be accepted. I mean, look at what happened to Nokia. I mean, they went from number one to nothing in no time flat because the new smartphones were so much better, relatively speaking, than the phones that were already out there. Or if you want to go farther back, I remember Remember when VHS tapes switched to DVDs, you're like, wow, the sound and the video is so much better on these DVDs than VHSs. That's just a better product and you start seeing those things. So if you're making a better product, it has a relative advantage over something, it's doing it better, that better mousetrap is more likely going to sell than the previous product, okay? So better products, more likely it's going to get accepted. But the best product doesn't always win, so there's other factors we have to kind of think about. Another thing you want to think about is the compatibility of that innovation with the market you're selling. Well, here's the thing. I'm on the Shetland Islands. Do you notice there's no trees out there? Yeah, the only trees you see in the Shetland Islands are in, like in people's gardens, okay? Trees don't really grow here. So if I'm an innovator, I'm an innovator in the treehouse industry. Well, here's a problem. Do treehouses really work? Are they compatible with the Shetland Islands? I mean, there's no trees to put a treehouse in. So no, that innovation's probably gonna fail. So that's not gonna work. So you have to think about that. 
where we're going to release this innovation, where is it going to be the biggest bang for the buck? That's where you want to go because it's more likely to be accepted. If I go to Oregon or Washington where there's lots and lots of trees all around and forests everywhere, yeah, the treehouse revolution will do really well there because there's trees to put the tree houses in because that is a compatible thing. That's why some of the best flip flops in the world, where are they from? They're Havaianas, which are from Brazil, which has got warm weather and you wear flip flops a lot. It kind of works that way. So you got to think of that compatible compatibility thing as well. Now, the third factor I want to talk about is observability. Can people actually see the difference? Okay. Being a better product is nice, but if people can't see why you're a better product or how you're a better product, it doesn't really work. You want to make sure that, Hey, if people can observe my product and that it is better or it works better, you want to make sure they can see that. Okay. It's kind of like when you compare like a fast food burger, like a McDonald's cheeseburger to a steakhouse burger, like you can look at the difference like wait mcdonald's burger is this little tiny burger but but that steakhouse burger is so big and it's got bacon and like cheese that i can't even pronounce its name and the bacon on there looks so crispy and delicious yes i can see that it's a better burger than the mcdonald's burger so i'm more willing to buy it i'm willing to you know spend more money on those things that's what you're looking at so you want to make sure people can actually observe those differences observe that innovation so easier it is to see that innovation the easier it is for it to be accepted now the last factor I want to look at is kind of like two things put together. One is complexity, like how complex are these changes? How complex are the, is the innovation in general? And also the trialability of this new product. So in terms of complexity, the more complex your new product is, this new innovation is, the less likely it's going to be accepted. Because think about it. Do you want to like spend 10 hours learning how to turn on your new TV? No, I'm fine with what I have. I mean, I know every time I got to buy a new gaming system for my kids, I'm like, can we stick with the Nintendos? Because I know how those work, right? Because my kid wants to get an Xbox. I'm like, dude, I can't help you with that. All I know is about the Switch and, and the U and the Wii and the and Nintendo 64 and the GameCube and, and Nintendo Entertainment System from back when I was a kid. I know those things. So I prefer something I understand. If it gets too complex, I'm not going to go for it. So you got to be careful. And the thing is, if you have a very complex innovation, you're going to have to spend a lot more money on selling that innovation, explaining to people why it's good. You might not see the difference in this new peanut butter that has half the calories as before, but with half the calories eating three sandwiches a week of peanut butter and jelly, like a good student does, you can save yourself five pounds over one year. And as a freshman in college, that's an important thing to know, right? And so you got to think about those things. So make sure you're putting that, if it's complex, put it in ways that people can understand it. That's why trialability kind of goes with it, because if you have a product that's easy to try out and, and experiment with, it's more likely people are going to buy it. They're going to accept that innovation. I remember way back in the day when the first Nintendo Wii's came out, you know, remember the bowling game you play with your grandma or the tennis game you play with your parents when you were a kid? Yeah, those things, everybody can use them. It's so simple to use, right? So remember, it's not complex. But also, I remember companies were talking about how the Wii was the end of Nintendo because it was nowhere near as powerful as the latest PlayStation or the latest Xbox. It's The graphics are so simple. But the thing is, at that time, parents wanted their kids to get off the, uh, off the couch from playing video games. Hey, it gets people up and moving around. But what really made it work is when you'd walk into a Best Buy or a Saturn if you're in Europe when I was living there, you'd walk in and they'd have a, a Wii right there. And you'd see grandmas bowling. You'd see kids bowling. You'd see people playing tennis. So like, wait, once you try it, like, I got to play this game. I mean, the Wii has been, you know, that hasn't sold games for, I don't know, 10 years now. And yet I still go home and visit my parents. They've got a Wii there and we'll do Wii bowling with the kids. You know, we all can play it together because it's so easy to do. It's so easy to try out. So it's easy to try out your products. More likely it's going to be accepted, right? Hint, hint, hint. This is why when you go to the grocery store, they give out the free samples. Hey, if you try this little free sample, you might actually buy it. And you're like, oh, that's actually pretty good. I'll take a bag of those meatballs. Those are pretty nice. Thank you. If you didn't try it out, you'd never buy those meatballs, right? So you got to think about those things. So I hope this helps you understand some of the 
factors that actually influence innovation in terms of how innovation is accepted in the marketplace. And you put that into your, your kind of strategies when you're starting to release new products and release new innovations so it can help you get that innovation out there to be accepted sooner so you can have a successful business. So I hope this helps you know a little bit more about getting your new products out on the market. If you want to learn more, hit that subscribe button, give us a like, and we put out new business videos every week. Buy from the Shetland Islands, and you definitely should come here. If by chance you do and you want to get a, this is a quarter zip from, from, from the US, but if you want to get some actually Shetland designed uh, wool stuff, actually Shetland designer, uh, Wilma, super nice lady, designs all the, the stuff here. You can pick some stuff up when you're here, really nice. Anyway, I'll talk to you later and buy from the Shetland Islands. Hey there, fellow marketing innovators, Professor Walters here, and today we're here in Quincy, Illinois, my hometown, and today we're going to talk about is the diffusion of innovation theory, okay? And basically what the diffusion of innovation theory looks at, it kind of relates to how the process of innovation kind of flows through time, how it flows through your marketplace, how it's kind of accepted by different categories of adopters of an innovation. Because think about it, right now we all have our fancy, you know, smartphones, right? But the thing is, when the first iPhones came out and the first smartphones came out, not everybody bought them day one. We all wanted them day one, but we didn't all have them day one. It took till the iPhone two or three before the iPhone was everywhere and the smartphone revolution had finally really taken hold. And the thing is, this diffusion of innovation theory really helps us as companies know how does an innovation take hold? Who are the first people we should talk to? Who are the second people we should talk to? When are we really going to start making money here? How do we talk to these different people in these different areas? And so what I'm going to go through today are each of the different kind of set of adopters of innovation, okay, to give you an idea. We're going to talk about how you can use this in a real world setting because this really does help us identify who that target market should be for our new innovation and when we should target different ones because you know what? We weren't targeting my parents with this new you know, smartphone with the first iPhones. It took a few times. My dad's first iPhone was an iPhone 10. Okay, so it took a few generations before he finally got on board, all right? Also, it's because his flip phone finally broke, so he had no choice, and you couldn't get flip phones anymore. Anyway, let's get started. Now, the first group we, call, we have is what are called innovators. This is like the first 2.5% of accept, people of accepting the innovation, okay? These are the people that want to have the newest widget. They want to be the first one in line. These are the people that are, you know, their opening night for the movie at the preview, sitting there in line three days before, so they can be the first one in to get the primo seats to see the first newest, whatever, Star Wars or MCU movie or whatever. I mean, these people are the gung-ho super fans, right? These are your typical fanboys. And if you think about it, if I'm releasing a, a science fiction movie or I'm re releasing a a comic book movie. You know, six months beforehand, a year beforehand, two years beforehand, I've got to go to San Diego Comic Con, right? I got to announce it, right? I got to let the fanboys know that the new Batman movie is coming so they'll get all excited and they'll talk about it like, oh, the new Batman's going to come. Batman's going to do this. Batman, Batman, Batman. And they're going to get really pumped about it. And the thing is, these innovators usually are really knowledgeable about the product, okay? So the the fanboys, why are they fanboys? Because they're big fans of Batman, right? And so they're going to know his history, his backstory, they're going to know the difference between all the different Robins that are out there and which one was the best, which one was the worst, all these kind of things. And so they have all this knowledge. And so, of course, they'll make their videos on YouTube and they'll talk about it in their blogs and stuff like that. But they really want to be the first people there. But the thing is, also, they're also going to be the ones that's going to point out something that's wrong. Well, Batman's cow doesn't have a chin strap or I remember when the Harry Potter movies came out the first day the big Harry Potter fans went and they were all upset they're like Harry's eyes aren't green in the movie in the book it talks he's got green eyes just like his mother and, and the actor has brown eyes oh I am not gonna watch this Harry Potter movie ever again because they gave him the wrong colored eyes hmm well here's the thing those innovators, they are the gung-ho ones. They can get a lot of good word out. But the thing is, since they're so like gung-ho, sometimes they don't influence the market as much as you think. That's why you'll see movies, comic book movies, for example. The fanboys might not like it, but it still does great business. Why? Because the normal everyday people enjoy it, right? And so you got to think about that. And so when we transition from those innovators, those like cutting edge, I got to know everything. I know everything already, but I want to be the first one out there. 
we move on to our next group. And that next group are the early adopters. This is about 13.5% of the market. And here, they're taking a bit less risk than those innovators. I mean, the early adopters, they're waiting to hear what were the reviews about this movie? You know, if the reviews are good, I'm definitely gonna see it. If the reviews are bad, I'll think about it. You know, they're, they're waiting to see. They're not just gonna blindly go see that movie because I'm a Star Wars fan, I'm gonna see it, I don't care. They're gonna read the reviews beforehand. Okay, it sounds like it could be good. I'll go and see that because they wanna make sure the product works, right? And so we kind of think of it that way. So here, you might have people that go see the movie on the first weekend. Maybe not they're the first, like, first showing, but they go the first weekend, kind of stuff like that. And the thing is, as they're kind of seen more as, like, normal people, they tend to have more influence. They tend to be the opinion leaders, okay? It's kind of like if I ask about what kind of laptop I should buy, and someone tells me, you got to get a Mac, and they have a tattoo of Steve Jobs on their arm, I'm probably not going to listen to them. But if there's somebody, yeah, you know, I, I usually, my, my buddy that usually has pretty good tech stuff is usually up on things. Things. If he or she gives me some suggestions, oh, a Mac versus PC, depends what you're looking to do, blah, 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 I'm going to trust them more because they're kind of like the cutting edge kind of thing, but not like Steve Jobs tattoo cutting edge, right? And so we have that. And once these kind of early adopters kind of move through, then we move on to our next kind of set of adopters. That's the early majority. This is when your company, your product, your innovation is really starting to make money, okay? And that's about 34% of the market. And the thing is, is if you're starting to make money, do you think competition is gonna sit back and let you make money with no competition? Of course not. If you look at it in terms of the overall genre of comic book movies, it took the MCU to really start making billion dollar movies to really to make DC and other movie companies to start making lots and lots of comic book movies. Because why did we never have too many throughout the years? Well, we weren't sure if it was gonna work, we didn't know what was gonna happen. This whole shared universe idea, I don't know. But now they've shown it does work, that innovation really does work. Now the competition comes in. Now I'm not saying DC is doing a good job with it, but they're at least trying. And so you start having these shared universes and things like that. And the thing is, this early majority where you're starting to turn profits, if you're not getting that early majority to really buy into your movie and go watch it, you're not going to be a long-term success. Because that's where you see is sometimes movies just make a ton of cash their opening weekend and then it just drops off. Oh, they're not going to make their money. It depends. That second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh week, that's when you're like, man, they're still making money? This is incredible. Jumanji movies, the newer Jumanji movies, they're doing it long-term. Man, they're making good money. Not a ton up front, but then people hear about it and how fun it is with The Rock. And boom, boom, people keep seeing it week after week after week after week after week after week. Man, I understand. And that early, that early majority, that's when you really start making some money. And the thing is, to get that early majority to kind of buy in, that's when you start seeing more of these number one movie in America. For the third week in a row, the number one movie in America is they start doing those things. So that early majority realizes, hey, a lot of people are gonna go see this, so I should join on too. And the thing is, overall, what they're doing with this early majority is they're really waiting to make sure all the bugs are out of the system. This would be the people that, they're not buying the newest Windows the first day. You know, that's the innovators, right? And they're not buying it the first six months. Those are the early adopters. They're waiting six months till the big security patch comes on and says, okay, here's all these bugs we found. Now it's gonna work just fine. That's when you go in and buy it, right? And so you have that kind of early majority that does that. Now, the next step we have are what we call the late majority. This is another 34%. And these are consumers who still buy the new product, but it's kind of, after the product has run its usual course. So instead of going to the movie theater to see the movie, I'm waiting until it shows up on Netflix or Disney Plus or something like that. So I'm still spending money. I'm not spending as much money because you think about it. I've got my, you know, Netflix subscription for 12 bucks, right? Well, that's 12 bucks for my whole family to watch all they want. Whereas if I took them to the movie theaters, it's 12 bucks per ticket plus popcorn. We're looking at $60 hey, that late majority, they're spending a lot less money to buy this innovation, but they still are actively buying it, okay? That's why you'll see all these articles online, what's new coming to Netflix? So people get excited, I'm like, ooh, it's coming to Netflix. I'm like, yeah, but you already started at the theater. Well, you have this kind of group there. And then the last group we have are what are called laggards, okay? The laggards, about 16% of the market, and they may never actually buy the product. They might ever, never ever buy it. And so the thing is, you're not really targeting them at all. This is kind of like, you ever been laying on your couch and you can't find your remote and a movie comes on, you're like, ugh, I can't find the remote, I don't want to get up, and you just watch it? So sometimes laggards do see the movie, 
but they don't actively go out and try to get it. So you do have that. And so what you'll see in this laggard part, you'll see that they tend to avoid change. They tend to avoid going for new stuff. So you're not really kind of going after them with your innovation. But the thing is, sometimes what they end up doing is they rely on kind of older technology until it's no longer available and they're kind of forced into the newer technology like my dad with his smartphone i mean flip phone until the iphone 10 okay that's a long time it's 10 years he's like nah i'm good nah i'm good nah i'm good then it breaks he's like well i can't do anything else so sometimes laggers do kind of get dragged into there so you do have that and the thing is is when we look at this diffusion of innovation theory what we're really using it for is a lot of different things but what's helpful is it helps us to determine which customers to focus on on which times. So to build up the hype of like two years before we make the movie, yes, we're going for the fanboys, those innovators, right? But then we wanna really like kick it up and get the general audience to go out there. We need to know that, hey, if we're gonna target them, we gotta let them know that, yes, it's so good. It's the number one movie in America. So you have those kind of things. And what really helps you know is, it kind of helps you predict who will buy the product at what which time and so we don't have to focus on target market that isn't going to buy at that time there's no reason to go after my dad to buy the newest iphone look we don't have to do with that he'll eventually get there maybe we don't target them at all and another thing you might look at is how you're going to price it at each one of these different things if you think about it those iphones right when they first come out they're a thousand bucks then after a few months it's like 800 and then when the newer iphone comes out then the price drops even more we do that because we see for each one of these different kind of set of adopters there's a different price point that might get them right hey i will pay extra money to be at the the grand opening of or the world premiere of the new star wars movie then uh, then some people like no, no i'll just pay to go see it the first night to see it on imax and then there's people yeah i'll go i'll pay for it to go see it at the dollar show and then there's the people well it comes with my netflix subscription so it's really like only pennies so there's different pricing points you're going to have also there might be different ways you put out your innovation i mean if you think about it in terms of how how dvds or or, or movies come out now after they've been in the theater right then they have the oh the digital download only right you have a few weeks of just digital download and then the blu-ray comes out right then there's the blu-ray edition and then if you just want the the cheap normal old school dvd version then that one comes out like a month after and the thing is is these things don't have to take a long period of time because with movies it's like look this movie just came out people are on dvd people want to buy it now we can't wait six months to put it on normal dvd we got to have it so look Look, the Blu-ray people or the, the, the Ultra HD, whatever, you know, see it in hologram form people, they'll pay the highest price for it. We'll put that one out there because we don't want them accidentally buying the cheap DVD version. Oh, no, 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 no. We want to get them the higher point or the Blu-ray point and stuff like that. So you might have it priced differently. You might have different types of innovations coming out at different times, at different price points to kind of think about those things. And also overall, it just really helps this diffusion of innovation theory. It also helps you know is when and where to promote this innovation. And I know I talked about with the, the Comic Cons and stuff like that, but it's really true. Because we realize that, look, if we want to get people to buy into the phone, we really have to promote it in, on TV, right? So people know that these new phones are out there, but the people at the AT&T store, at the Vodafone store, they really have to be able to explain the difference between a smartphone and why you need this versus your old flip phone, okay? Because yeah, my flip phone took pictures, yeah, but this one, you can post on the internet, you can share with people, you can watch movies on there, you can check your stocks. My dad's like, oh, I can check my stocks. Yes, you can buy your stocks and sell them on there too. Oh, I see, that works for me. And so you have different things that really kind of click with each one of those different groups and that kind of helps you out. So I know this is kind of a long, complicated story about the diffusion of innovation theory, but honestly, it is super effective when you've got a new innovation coming out, knowing who to target. Because one of the mistakes I see a lot of entrepreneurs make is they say, my new product is perfect for everybody. It might be, but you gotta focus down on who's gonna get the biggest bang first, who's gonna promote it, and then work your way through. Because if you're trying to sell to everyone, you'll sell to no one, okay? So, I wish y'all the best, and uh, have a great time. Bye from Quincy. Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here. And today we're gonna talk about is how companies develop new products. Like, what's kind of the overall process they go through step by step in order to go from you know an idea of a concept of a phone to actually having that phone out in the market okay and obviously with any new product where do we start 
We start with idea generation. We've got to come up with ideas for new products and those ideas can come from all over the place. It could be from, oh, we see something our competition does. Oh, we talk to our clients and say, oh, they need this. Our suppliers might mention something to us. There's a lot of different places where these new ideas can come from. And of course, we need to judge our ideas and things like that to see if it's a, a real idea, would it work for us, these kind of things. We all kind of take this together, but there is this idea generation part where we have to figure out is, hey, is this a good idea for us to grow our business? And that, that's where it kind of starts at, this, like, this idea generation process part, okay? Now, once you have this idea, right, now we have to go about and developing a concept test, okay? Or we do what's called concept testing, okay? For example, eventually I went to another study abroad program with my students, you know, and I gotta think about that. Where could they wanna go? What could they wanna do? Maybe we'll go to Italy, maybe we'll go to Spain, maybe we'll go to Germany, maybe we'll go to China. We'll go to one of those places we can go back to again and have a good time at. And so I'm going through my idea generation, think of all the stuff we can do. And then when I develop my concept testing, this is when I put it together. Okay, I've decided we're going to do 10 days in Spain. And in there, we're going to spend five days in Madrid and five days in Barcelona. Okay, I have that. And then how are we going to break it down? Well, you figure Madrid one day, we've got to have a free day to go see the museums, right? And then another day we're going to go see, hmm, let's see, we're going to learn oh, how they make Spanish guitars. And, and another day we're going to go see, hmm, let's see, some of the big factories there. We'll do that in Barcelona. Oh, I've got a friend of mine who's a big insurance person there. He can get us in with some people. We'll do a tour of Camp New, the, the, the FC Barcelona side soccer stadium. I'm just kind of getting the concept out there, like the rough idea of what this product is. And when you're doing that concept testing, you're really just testing the idea. How do you think this will work? And you're usually asking your customers, hey, what do you think about this? So for my students, would a 10 day trip to Spain, you know, next year be something you might want to do or might not? Because there's a lot of things that are going to be influencing that. Okay. Now, once we get past the concept testing, you know, like the kind of idea phase and breaking it down a little bit more, now we have to get into the product development part. And here we're really developing those prototypes, those first working models. Now, if we look at it in terms of airplanes, these are the first airplanes. It's not just a, a concept idea on a piece of paper. Now we're making models. Now we're making small planes that fly on their own and stuff like that to see is like, hey, could we have a plane this big? Let's test it out. And they're doing that and they're developing that product. And the thing is, while you're doing the product development, you're usually going through, remember in the other video, we talk about the concepts and the alpha testing, the beta testing, till we get our final product, right? And then that's what we're thinking about. We wanna to get to that final product. And so when we're developing it, the next thing we're gonna do is actually do some test market or market testing, see how the market feels about this product. Are they interested in it? Would they buy it, you know? And you might have small markets out that you test it out in, right? So like McDonald's, they might go to a small town or a small town that represents their typical client base and test out a new burger to see what do they think about it? Are they buying this or not? You know, we're just testing it, okay? And I think I gotta tell you is each one of these steps, we have a video on that goes more in depth that really helps you explain or helps you understand what we're talking about here. This is just giving that overall new product development process idea, okay? And so after we finish all this test, we figured out the right way we wanna do things, right price we were gonna put it at, right way we're gonna market it, all kinds of stuff. Now we have our commercialization. We're putting it out in the market. This is when we actually put it onto the shelves. We're deciding, where do we sell it first? Where do we sell it second? Who's gonna be that main customer that's first? We lay these things out because if you think about it, you know, you'll see like some stores get the new iPhone first and then six months later, someone, another store does. Why is that? It's all part of our rollout. It's all part of our commercialization. And this is where we're really laying out those like four Ps. We're really putting that price, product, place, promotion kind of stuff. That's when it's actually going out into the market, okay? We've done our product launch. It's out there, okay? And I know sometimes you say commercialization, product launch, they kind of count to kind of the same thing here if you kind of think of it that way. But the thing is, you do your product launch, you got it out there, it's being commercialized, people are buying it, and then we have to do evaluation of results. So is the product selling? Is it doing what it says? Are customers believing it? I mean, we have to think about these things. Is it really working? Are the people buying it? Oh, it's a hair shampoo that helps the hair grow back. Well, our clients are saying it's not really working. At least mine isn't. So you have to think about these things. So sometimes when you go back and you evaluate your results of this new product development, you start to see, hey, you know what? 
it's not doing what it says. Maybe we need to sell it in a different way. You might see that it's more effective in other ways. Like if you look up the history of Viagra, you know, the erectile dysfunction drug actually started off not as erectile dysfunction. It was a side effect that the erectile dysfunction stuff stopped, right? And it's like, oh, well, we saw with the results, it actually worked better here. Maybe we take it back and try to sell it to something else or we redesign it, redevelop that product and see, you know what, there's something else we might not, we might need in there, okay? And so when companies develop new products, they really do go through this kind of step-by-step -step process just to make sure they're covering all their bases. So if you want to review it again, you start with the idea generation, come up with that idea. Then the concept testing, you're starting to break it down to get some ideas from your customers if they like that idea. Then you do your product development, actually make an actual product that people can try out. And then of course you do your market testing to see how the market feels about this product. And then you launch it when it's ready to go, you have your product launch. And then afterward you have to evaluate results to see if your new product did what you thought it would do. So I hope this helps you understand kind of the overall new product development process. If you wanna learn more, we've got tons of videos on new product development, so check them out. Bye. Hey there, fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're on the beaches of El Salvador. And today what I talk to you about is some of the steps in the marketing research process. And what we're really gonna focus on today is concept testing and product development. You know, coming with that prototypes and testings of the alpha testing and beta testing, things like that. I wanna talk about those things because when you're looking at your product development and you're coming up with new products, once you kind of have gone through your idea generation, hey, I've got these ideas for really great ways to to grow our YouTube channel or to sell more products or make new products. We really get through that idea generation part. Now we really have to put the concept down on paper. And that comes down to concept testing, okay? What is that product concept? We're gonna write it all down. We're gonna talk to our customers and our clients and say, hey, what do you think about this? Hey, Professor Walter's channel watchers, what would you think if I did a whole channel on soft skills? Well, we did a whole series of videos on teaching you the soft skills of being a marketer, how to deal with clients, how to deal with rejection, how to turn that no into a yes. And so I'm giving you these ideas and by giving you that concept of what that new playlist series would be, I would judge from your reaction. Is it positive? They say, yes, these are videos we'd love. Or if they say, nah, Mark, just stay with that. Stay, Professor Walter, stay with that like basic marketing stuff. That's your more your speed. And so when you get this kind of feedback from the concept from your customers, it helps you kind of kickstart that marketing research process and go, okay, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna look at this. We're gonna develop a product that fits right into that concept that they want, okay? So you have that, all right? So once you've gotten past the concept testing phase, now we're moving to the next phase. That's that product development. Because we really need to come up with kind of a working prototype to see if, can we really do this? Can we make something like that? What's it going to look like, okay? So if you think about it, a prototype is that rough model that first comes out. If you ever watch old car commercials, they'll show people like making a design of a car in clay so the, so the, the wind can go over it and they can test things like that. How will that look? You know, when you ever see them, oh, it's a prototype prototype car. Oh, it's the first of a kind. We're seeing if the concept really works. Can it physically happen? That's what a prototype is. Now, once we get this prototype so it really works, now we're going to start doing some testing, okay? You have what's called alpha testing. Alpha testing is when you're testing your products in-house, so in the company itself. So probably Gillette, they probably have a lot of alpha testing. When people come to work at Gillette, they might have people shave and try out new razors. And the thing is, by having this alpha testing, our people that know the industry, know our products, they're noticing some of the bigger mistakes. Oh wait, this doesn't glide so well, or this doesn't work so well. All right, we're getting some good feedback here from our people that work with us. But anytime you're working with something that you already know about, you kind of miss a lot of issues. I mean, think about it. In your room, do you think your room is dirty? Your mom's like, oh my goodness, your room's a pigsty. And you're like, yeah, it's not that bad, because you know how it works. You know that you're, you know, yeah, no, my clean clothes are underneath the dirty stuff there. There's a, there's a fine line of towels above it that keeps the dirty and the clean separate. No one else would know that. 
but you do. And the alpha testers, they know how these things work. So sometimes they miss some of those mistakes. That's why once you've done a lot of alpha testing and you're starting to develop a product that's good enough for in-house, then we start doing what's called beta testing. Okay, beta testing is when you go out and you find a select group of customers and you have them try out your product. Maybe some of you have done beta testing for some software or maybe a game out there. Why are they doing that? Well, they want to have your feedback. How does the game play? Are there any glitches? I mean, think about it. When the company's making the game, they're thinking, oh, people want to play the game through, right? Beginning to end. But how many of you just like to explore? You know, the Spider-Man games on PlayStation, you're just swinging around. This is so cool. It looks just like New York. Oh my gosh. You know, you have this cool feeling and you're like, oh wait, why do I keep hitting this wall here? The beta testers are testing out all these different variations that you might've thought of. And you take all that feedback and you put that back into your product development because that helps us make an even better product. We finally actually do commercialize the product. We actually put it on the market to sell. And that's why it's really important to know those steps start with that concept that overall idea what you want to do ask your customers if it's okay if they say yeah it's good go for it then you come up with your prototype the basic kind of ideas how it's going to fit together then what you're going to do after that you make that alpha test and you test in-house and once you kind of clear that hurdle then you have some beta testers some clients test it for you see what's out there and you get those mistakes out of the way so when it rolls out across the world it works just fine and everything goes okay all right so i hope this helps you understand the difference kind of between a concept test, a prototype, alpha testing, and beta testing. So uh, I wish you all the best, and I'll say bye from here in El Salvador. Hey, the fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're going to talk about is market testing. Basically, how do we go out and see if our products are going to be a success? How, how do we how do we know? Should I sell this movie as a romantic comedy or an adventure or a sci-fi action flick? What should I do? Do I do I sell this new burger as a healthy alternative, or do I sell it as a non-meat alternative, or do I sell it as the the safest thing to eat at your local restaurant? What do I need to do? And so what companies do is they actually do test marketing. They see how things work. And we have a video on how to test market, not to test market, when to do that. We have that. But in general, in this video, what I want to talk about just in general is what are market tests and, and what are some types of market testing we might have. And the thing is, sometimes you actually market test or you do test marketing before the product even exists, before you put it out there on the market or anything. So it's called a pre-market test, okay? Here what you're gonna do is you run tests with potential clients and you talk to them about what your product is, how do you think it's gonna work. You might test things out beforehand to gauge their interest, okay? So you might do a, a survey of your customers, ask them, so so what do you think that a movie with Captain America and Iron Man should be sold as? A buddy movie? A superhero movie? Another part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe? What do you think? And so you'll test market it that way and get their opinions out there. And the thing is, the information you gain from your clients really help you better understand how it should be sold. Because if you don't know how your clients are going to see it, well, you might have some problems, okay? And the thing is, there's a lot of companies like Nielsen, they'll do pre-test marketing to see, hey, what do people think of this product? So for example, if I'm going to sell a product that's from the Midwest, is there a certain kind of motif or kind of atmosphere or kind of vibe I need to have versus something that is gonna be sold from California or if it's sold from Italy, right? You're like, oh, if it's from Italy, well, it should have like cool style and stuff like that. There needs to be like an Italian flag or maybe the Leaning Tower of Pisa, something needs to show that it's Italian. You learn these things out there from early test marketing. The thing is you'll see is sometimes with big movies, they might actually do some test screenings before the movie's even done filming to see how is the audience feeling? Are they are they liking this fight scene? Are the jokes hitting right? Yes or no? And then what happens with this pre-market test, we figure these things out and realize, you know what? We need to change the ending of the movie. We need to package it differently. We need to sell it in a different way because people are seeing it in something different. So you're doing all this stuff before the product's even out. You're just getting ideas and making changes, okay? Now, on the other side of things, you actually do a test market. And what this basically is, is a firm really goes out and it goes into a kind of a small market. 
and sells their products and see what works. So we might test it in one market when we try to sell our new hamburgers, you know, the, the non-beef burgers, right? We go to one market, we sell it as the non-beef alternative. We go to another market, we sell it as the healthy alternative. We go to another market, we sell it as something completely different. And we see what works, right? We see like, did they like it this way? Which one got people to buy it more? Also, you might see that with burgers. They might set, they might test market in one area where it is burger, cheese, ketchup, mustard, pickle, relish, you know, this way. But another market, they put they put the cheese first, then the lettuce, then the burger, and they might test it in different ways. But they're going out there and having kind of a mini product launch to see if it's working or how it's gonna work or what would work best when we commercialize it and put it all out there for the entire world. Because we wanna see is what's gonna work best. And the thing is, when we look at specific test markets, there's three I wanna kinda of talk about. One you have is called a simulated test market. This is where you're basically faking it. So you might look at some grocery stores, they might actually have a fake store, a simulated store set up will they test out different configurations where do we put the potato chips where should we put the refrigeration part you know the freezer section where do we do that and they test out have you know have customers come through in this kind of fake store to see how they shop does put in the frozen food first make things better or worse what should we do but it's all simulated it's a fake store and the thing is with this fake store we can actually watch a lot of things you might have it where you bring customers in just just to kind of see how they shop and you track where are they looking when are they stopping where do we see the bottlenecks in our store setup right you might have that but of course it's a simulated market it's not a real store because if you're going into a real aldi or a real walmart you're shopping very different than when you go to a simulated one where there's actually tons of people at the register and there's people that want to help you you don't have that in the real world right so it's simulated it's not always necessarily the real world kind of stuff so that's why you might do what's called a controlled test market and in a controlled test market you might hire i don't know three four five whatever stores to carry your product you're like look carry our product sell it let us know how it goes okay so it's controlled in terms that it's a controlled in terms of where it's being sold and then you can have them sell your products and you ask what sold well what didn't sell well what were the questions people had and then we can gain that information from them and then we can expand bigger right but it's more of a control like little few stores kind of thing now another one you can look at is what we just call a standard test market with a standard test market Market, you're going for a bigger layout right it's basically we're gonna be test marketing this in you know Champaign Illinois we're gonna test market this just in New York City or we're just gonna test market this in Minneapolis and it's just one city and what you're gonna do is you'll have you know your advertising campaign you'll have your promotion campaign products will be out there so people can buy it but no one else outside of that region can outside that test market so it kind of gives you a small representation of what it would be like if it's out there in the real market I know when uh, when I went to college the town I was in was very popular for McDonald's to test market different sandwiches and I'd be like oh this one's really good it was like a it was like a Royale with cheese I guess you'd say uh, a quarter pounder but it had like mayonnaise and all the other like lettuce and tomato and all this I'm like this is great and when I go to other towns I'd come visit my parents here and I'm like I go to McDonald's like yeah I need this and they're like we don't carry that I'm like what how do you not have it it's amazing because it's only in that one standard test market you have that but what's cool if you could get that small test market and you can kind of control the promotion side of thing the advertising all this kind of things it can really help out to give you an idea of this is how it worked in a town of this size so you can kind of scale that up or scale that back to give us an idea because the thing is you do want to test market a lot of times to make sure you're selling your product right or maybe having your product in the right light in terms of how people perceive it or sometimes just making sure you got the lettuce and tomato in the right order just to get the most taste for what people prefer so i hope this helps you know a bit more about market testing again we've got plenty of videos on whether to market test versus not market testing and all kinds of stuff when it comes to new product development also coming into marketing research there's all kinds of stuff to help you out so hit that subscribe button and you'll have a lot more marketing videos to help you anyway i'll say bye from here in the small cute town of Quincy. Bye! 
to test market or not to test market? That is the question of today's video. And that's a question that a lot of marketers have to ask themselves. Do we test market or do we not test market? And so what we wanna go through today are the reasons why companies should test market. And sometimes why maybe it's not necessarily worth it to do test marketing. Cause if you're thinking about doing a test market. This is gonna take you a lot of time and a lot of money and you have to kind of judge that to the benefits you're gonna get for doing that test marketing, okay? Because maybe you don't have a lot of money to do the test market, or maybe you don't have a lot of employees or a lot of time to be spent on that. Like, do we have time to test this out for a year before we put it in the market, or should we just go right away because our competitor did it and it looks fine, so let's do it like them. So there's some really, there's a lot of things you really have to think about. And the thing is, if you're looking at why you should test market, one, if you were spending a lot of money to develop a product, okay, you probably want to test market this product because, hey, we want to make sure if we're going to invest this much time, this much energy in the product itself, let's learn as much as we can so we can sell it best, okay? That's why movie studios, they'll test market movies six months before it's released to make sure how people are seeing the movie. Do they like the ending? Do we need to tweak the ending out there? That's why sometimes you'll hear, oh, test markets didn't like that original ending, so they changed it so this happens out there, okay? And you kind of get those kind of things because they're test markets. I'm, look, I'm spending hundreds of millions of dollars on this movie. I want to make sure that it's going to be a success. Okay, so you're doing that. Another thing, if you're going to be, you know, playing around with your really big key brand, we want to make sure we're not going to kill that golden goose or kill that cash cow by messing around with it so much. So maybe we'll test, hey, let's do a little test market on different cans of Coca-Cola we're going to use. Okay, we're not going to change the whole formula. We're just going to test this different sizes first to see if people want the maybe a smaller club can or they like those little tiny cans they have on planes. Let's see how that works. And we could test market that way to see which small smaller size people do buy or bigger size. Do we do the two liter, a three liter, a one liter? What works in different markets? Let's test that out before we roll it out nationwide. Also, you might want to test market your product if you're not sure of you know, what order things should be in or, or maybe you have an idea like restaurants, okay? They'll be testing out food. They'll say, okay, what's the best way to make our burger? Is it you know, bun, burger, cheese, lettuce, tomato, or do we go bun, cheese, burger, cheese, lettuce, tomato, or is it bun, cheese, burger, no pickles or stuff like that? They do that to test out which one works best, which one appeals to people. Because I'm, I'm telling you right now, if you eat a cheeseburger and you, the cheese is on the bottom versus the cheese is on the top, it's going to taste differently. You're not sure the next time you're eating a burger, flip it over, eat it upside down. You might notice there's a slight different flavor profile when you take a bite because they're, the, the flavors are hitting your mouth and your tongue and your taste buds in a different order. And so we might want to test these things out, okay? Because basically what it comes down to, if you're not sure, probably want to test market, okay? Now, on the other side of things, you might say, you know what, do I really need to test market? And there are some times that really, you don't really need to test market when you're doing these things. One thing you want to think about it, if it's just a simple line extension, so it's not costing you a lot of money, it's not a lot of effort to do that, then, then maybe we just go ahead and do it. So maybe we have our Big Mac burger at McDonald's and we just throw some bacon on top. So we got the bacon Big Mac. Does it take much to test that out? No, we just try it on there, put it on there for a week for bacon Big Mac week and see if it sells. If a lot of people people buy it, great. If not, hey, we just a little extension, we get rid of the bacon part, and we're back to that normal Big Mac. Another thing you might think about is you might look and see is, did our competitor release a similar product and it was a success? So if we see that our competition, you know, put out Diet Coke, and we saw that these diet sodas were doing great, well, maybe we throw it out our own version of our cola diet style. And you'll see that when a successful soda comes out, there's always gonna be imitators that come pretty quickly because they saw that, hey, the market was cool with that highly caffeinated drink, we're gonna make our own highly caffeinated drinks. If you look at it, kind of the, the sparkling alcohols now, you know, one company came out with those truly spritzed spr seltzer drinks with alcohol in it. Now everybody's coming out with them because they know, hey, look, the market has shown it's going to work. Let's just go ahead and put our product out there. Another reason why you might not test market, if it doesn't cost much money just in general. I mean, think about it. At restaurants, do you ever wonder why some of the times they have these, these specials of the day? Well, it could be that they actually got this really great deal on the salmon or on the steaks. They said, you know what? Let's just try it out. I mean, I, I got this great deal and we just have a limited supply so we can just go through 
for it to be done. See if it works. I mean, in a way, it's almost like it's test marketing, but it's not really because you're just putting it out there because it doesn't cost very much to do it. And the last one I want to talk about is if management is confident that this new product is going to be a success, sometimes they skip right to the end and just put it on the market. It doesn't always work out that way. I'm not going to lie to you, but sometimes if you have the confidence for it, I know people are going to buy this. Let's just put it out there now to get out there as soon as possible. We don't need a test market. Let's just get out there and go. Sometimes you skip it. So I hope this helps you know some of the reasons why you should or shouldn't test mark your product. If you want to learn more, we've got other videos here in El Salvador or other places around the world. We've made our marketing videos to help you learn a little bit more about marketing. So we'll say bye from here in El Salvador. And if you're going to test market or not to test market, that truly is the question. Bye. Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're gonna to continue our conversation about new product development, and today what we're gonna focus on is the commercialization of our new product because we've already developed this product we figured out what our customers want we developed a perfect little product or service they're really going to desire and now we have to figure out is how are we going to commercialize it how are we going to get it onto the market where are we going to sell it all these kind of things really putting together the four p's finally like together because we've got the first p we've got that new product but now we have to think about the prices the place where we're going to sell it how we're going to promote it and things like that because when you think about it we really have to start thinking about is when when are we going to put this product on the market? And the thing you have to realize is your market that you're selling to a lot of times will dictate when you release your product. For example, if I'm going to be releasing, you know, a water bottle for the beach, right? Well, if I'm going to do this, am I going to release it in December when it's cold and no one's thinking about hot weather and taking anything to the beach? Of course not. I'm going to release it closer to the summertime, right? Or if you think about it in terms of game consoles, right? They don't release them, you know, usually in the spring or in January. They release it before the holidays because that's when parents are willing to spend a lot more money to buy them a $500 gaming system. Because, you know, you might get that or Santa might get that for a kid for, for the holidays, but might not get them for a random Tuesday in January. Not a really big day. So we have to think about these things. And you think about with the gaming consoles, have you ever notice it's about every six years you get like a new PlayStation or a new Xbox and when a new PlayStation comes out you know that new Xbox is going to come out about the same time or another Nintendo is going to come out about the same time because they know we have kind of like a generational thing we need to all be coming out about the same time and so if another company let's say I don't know Apple wants to come out with a console gaming system they're not going to come out with it in the middle of the cycle they're going to come out when people are ready to buy a new console after a few years so you kind of plan those things out and that's when the you really have to consider when you're thinking about that when when is my market going to be ready to buy this okay and so you might think about that in terms of movies when do the big movies come out in the summer you have your summer tent pole movies why well you have all these kids that aren't in school right and so that's when they're out they need something to do parents don't have time to stay with their kids all the time let's throw them out an Avengers movie let's throw them at a sci-fi movie and let them stay there for three hours so we can clean the house you know you have to think about these things so really the when when we're starting to think about commercialization really is dictated by a lot of factors that you do have to consider. And then the next, I think, W word you need to ask yourself is where. Where are we going to launch it first? So you might look at it in terms of this way. Where are we going to launch it in terms of where is that target market going to be, right? So, hmm, if our target market is buying gaming consoles at Best Buy, we need to be at Best Buy. Or if people are buying their gaming consoles online, we need to have an online presence and sell it there. Because you really have to think about is where is our audience going to be buying stuff? Where are they deciding? That's where we need to be in order to get that target market. Because what we're really trying to do is find out is how can we do deliver the most value to that customer and in terms of that where it's going to be well what delivers me the most value it's where I buy it right and so we have to think about those things that's why we do so much marketing research and market research in general when we are developing a new product because it's not just making a new product it's also figuring out where we're going to put it okay now the next step I want to talk about is what we call the rollout which is kind of like a timing thing but also a where it's that where and and when kind of thing put together because you have to figure out and roll it out which stores are going to get our products first which regions are going to get our products first see i've lived all over the world and i remember you know i'd be in the u.s and the new nintendo 64 is out this october i'm like great and then i moved to europe in september and i'm thinking oh in october i'm going to get it no 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 it didn't come out to the next spring in europe i'm like what what happened well nintendo looked at it and said wait who are our biggest markets who should get these first because we don't want people not to be able to get it 
So they released it in the US and Japan first, and then a few months later, it was released in Europe, and a few months later after that, it was released in South America. You have this kind of idea of where am I gonna roll it out first, okay? And so you'll see companies do that where, you know, they'll test market in different areas to try to see what works first. If it works there, we're gonna go to more stores. So like when Burger King came out with their Impossible Whopper, it wasn't available everywhere at first. They rolled it out in certain stores, then certain stores, and then it went nationwide, okay? Because you have to think about that where and when and who's gonna go first, who's gonna go second, who's gonna go third, we have to think about those things. And sometimes you'll see that with new mobile phones. Sometimes it first comes out you know, only exclusively at AT&T. And then after six months, maybe it's at the other places, right? So we just try to think about these things out there. And you kind of put that where and when and where and when together. You gotta to think about those things when you are doing your commercializations of your product. And the thing is, it's not just the where and when, because if you think about it, the where part really is that kind of place part of the four P's. Because we're really trying to figure out is where should the product be initially sold? And things that might kind of really influence that as well, you might look at in terms of where we're gonna sell. Do they have delivery options? Or we might look at it in terms of will they be able to handle the extra inventory that we need to have them in there? Because if we're gonna have a big, huge TV kind of thing, are we gonna have space in a small store to sell it? No, we probably need to put it in the big box stores like a Walmart or Best Buy or something like that. Now, another of the four P's we have to focus on in commercialization is promotion. A lot of times new products fail because people don't know it even exists, right? And so we really have to think about is where are all the places we need to promote our product yes we need to promote it to that end customer that's going to get that benefit out there right so we're going to make them make sure they know how good our product is what the difference is what makes it special why it's going to be perfect for them but the thing is it's not just about promoting your product to the end customer, you also have to promote your product throughout the supply chain. You have to explain to Best Buy why it would be a good idea to carry our game console. You have to explain to Cartoon Network why it would be good for us to have their com our commercials on their TV channels. You have to explain all these things out there and you have to consider all that when you're looking at your promotions. Because what you might end up doing is having trade promotions, you know, you might have a slotting allowance. Hey Best Buy, we're gonna pay you to put one of our consoles at the front door so people can see the new graphics and new controllers and try things out, but we're going to need to pay them to do that, right? So we have to think about those things with those slotting allowances, or maybe you do a trade allowance or advertising allowance. Hey, if you advertise our product in your promo flyer, we'll sell it to you at a little lower price so you can get it, a, you know, you can make more money in the end in your markups. Or other things you might think about in terms of promotion, you might have you know, the, the promotional you know, introductory pricing. I mean, think about it. How many of you have signed up for cable because the first month was $19.99 and then went skyrocketing prices after that? Well, we might think about that, those promotions, that goes into there. And I know that kind of ties in with pricing because you do have to think about pricing when it comes to new product you know, launching, right, and commercialization. And we do have a video that goes into a lot of different new pricing or new product pricing kind of setup. So do watch that video to get some of the ideas of the specific kind of new price, new product pricing strategies that companies can use. But we do have to think about is what is going to be our manufacturer's suggested retail price because we have to make sure that everybody in the supply chain is making money. Because if the delivery driver isn't making money, they're not going to deliver your products. If the in-store, you know, Best Buy is not going to make money selling your products, they're not going to carry it. And you got to make sure you're making money. You also got to make sure your customers are feeling like they're getting value out of these things for this new product. So you really have to think about a lot of things when you're developing your pricing. And you know, those slotting allowances where it helps to figure out where it's going to place also could affect the price pricing and stuff like that because hey if we're going to be paying for that stuff to be there we got to factor that into our costs and our pricing development it's a lot of stuff you really have to consider and the last little thing about the commercialization thing I want to talk about, I want to kind of go back to the promotion side of things. And what a lot of people don't realize is when you're promoting your product throughout your supply chain, sometimes it's about finding new suppliers, new retailers, new ways to get your product out. So you might actually go to a lot of trade fairs just to talk about your product so people know about these things. Because if you look back into history, people thought the Nintendo, you know, the Wii would be a failure, right? Like, oh, the graphics isn't very good. Nobody's going to want this because they get a PlayStation that has way better graphics where you can see the person head fly off when you chop it off in, in Mortal Kombat and and they don't even do that on the Wii right back in the day 
But the thing is, when they went to the trade shows, they were showing people how it worked and stuff like that. It's like, huh, you know what? This might just work. This is actually something that might work for everybody. Because sometimes seeing it in situ actually working can help your product sell better. That's why when you go to the trade shows and show it how it works, that might help it out. How many times have you gone to a Macy's or a Walmart or, a, or maybe your local grocery store and they have the free samples kind of stuff, those kind of things? We have to think about that. Will that entice people to try that new product? So it's a lot of things you really have to think about when you're doing your commercialization of your products, okay? And this is just touching the service, right? You know, make sure you're looking at the four Ps when you're developing your commercializations, also the where and when you're gonna sell these things, stuff like that all comes together when you're looking to commercialize a new product. So I hope this helps you give an idea of how that commercialization phase of new product development kind of comes about. If you want to learn more, we got plenty more videos to help you out. Bye. Hey there, fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're gonna to talk about expanding our four Ps when it comes to new product development, because we've been developing in our new products, right? That's the whole point of this chapter is new product development. But the thing is, when you develop new products, you still have to think about the other Ps of the four Ps. And so I wanna start talking about promotion. I mean, you really need to promote that new product because just because you built a better mousetrap, if people do not know that your new mousetrap is out there, it will not be a success. So you gotta figure out is what's the best way for me to promote this new product how do I get the word out there I know for my college students I tell this every year I say hey look your student ID do you realize you get discounts all over town with your student ID they're like what I had no idea yeah on your student ID look up your university and then look up discounts and see what you get you're like oh my goodness I could have been saving 10 or 15 percent at all these stores yes you could have but you didn't know because it wasn't promoted so you want to make sure you're thinking about how do we get the word out okay so sometimes what you do with promotion sometimes you have those introductory price promotions I mean remember Netflix oh the first month is free or maybe you know you get dish TV and it's like oh the first month is $19.99 or or with my Comcast cable it was like oh $19.99 for the first year and then after that it goes up you're doing some kind of promotion some kind of getting the word out or, or deal to get people to sign up at the you know at first and the thing is it's not just inspiring the end customer to buy you also have to inspire the retailer to buy so sometimes what you'll see is companies to promote they'll go to trade shows and trade fairs to let people know about their products they'll actually go and visit retailers and say hey look this is this great product we have that we think will be great for your customers and they go out there and they promote it that way and so sometimes what you end up doing is do what's called a trade promotion like look if you have our products you know we'll give you at a lower price to inspire them to care it. Look, you're going to make even more money on this price, this product if you carry it than if you didn't. So, hey, why not? You, you, you do some negotiations and stuff like that. And the thing is, you can also advertise in order to promote it. I mean, that's probably the easiest one out there because here's the thing. You can tell that retailer you should totally carry my product, but know who works really well telling them to carry it? If their own customers come in and say, hey, do you have that product out there? And so you inspire that end customer to come and ask for it, and then it pulls through the supply chain a lot easier. Easier. So try to inspire those end customers. Now, when you're looking at the place part of the four Ps with your new products, you have to think about is, you really have to determine where is gonna be the most successful place for me to sell my product? Yes, we have our online businesses and stuff like that, but we might also look at what retailers would work best. If we have a new mobile phone, we probably need to be at AT&T, Verizon, Vodafone, Sprint, those like, you know, telemobile phone companies, right? We gotta be there. And so we realize, hey, for people to accept our phone to be a real phone, we have to be in those locations, so we might sell there. Also, you might look at it in terms of how do you want your new product to be perceived? If you want it to be seen to be like for everybody, and affordable for everybody, then yeah, getting into that Walmart and Aldi is gonna be really helpful. But if you wanna make it have that little bit of like, I don't know, higher end feel like a little bit more exclusive maybe it's at best buy and target and saturn these fancier places right so we have to think about that and then also we have to think about the inventory levels that we're going to need to have for these new products also we're gonna have to look and see is where do our great first round customers the ones that are gonna be the most excited about our products where do they shop 
we got to figure that out and we try to get into that location and then we go into our pricing and don't worry we have plenty of videos on pricing and new products in our pricing chapter but you really want to think about it in terms of hey what price what's our manufacturer's suggested retail price where we're going to make our money but everybody else in the supply chain is going to make their money too we need to have an idea for that when we're putting our product out in the market because you could say oh it only cost us to ten dollars to make it so charge eleven uh will that dollar be enough profit for the retailer but also the people that deliver the product to the retailer and all the people in between we have to think about those things too. So sometimes what you'll see with your prices, you have to factor in things like slotting allowances where you actually pay to be shown. Like, oh, you wanna have the end cap? Yeah, that's gonna cost you money to be there. Oh, you wanna be at the checkout aisle? Oh, that's gonna cost you money too. So we have to think about those things and factor that into our prices of our new products. Then of course, you have to think about your timing. When are you gonna release that new product, right? And you look at in terms of when do people buy this type of product? There's a reason why the summer blockbusters come out in the summer, because that's when customers have time to go to the movies again and again and again. And you, that's why you don't see a lot of big blockbusters coming out in February or March or October, because those traditionally are lower, you know, movie going times, right? So we don't want to put it out then. So think about that too, when you're thinking about releasing your new product, how is that going to affect it? All right. So just a few things to think about when you're releasing your new products. We got plenty more videos on new products, like why they fail, why they succeed, where do the ideas come from. Check out those videos to get some more ideas. And I'll say bye from very sunny, very hot Georgia. Bye. Hey there fellow marketing students, Mark here. And today we're here at Grace Bay in Turks and Caicos, a beautiful place to be. And the thing is what we're gonna talk about today is actually when companies develop new products or they're thinking about developing new products, they wanna ask themselves, do I think this is gonna be a success? Because you might have ideas for new products, but if you're not sure if it's gonna work or if it's really gonna be a, a really booming success, you might decide, you know what? I'm not gonna try this new product out. And so we're gonna go through today are four different ways you can kind of think about in order to deem if there's a good chance that our new product is gonna be a success, okay? And the first thing, and the one that kind of makes more sense if you think about it in a way is, is it a better product than what's already out there? I mean, if there's a relative advantage that people can see and notice on this new product versus what's already out there, of course, that's gonna be a better chance of success. I remember way back in the day when they used to show DVD versus VHS tapes, and you could see the superior sound quality, the superior visual quality, like, wow, that is just a better product. Yeah, if you build a better mousetrap, it's more likely to succeed. So that's the first thing, if you have that really good relative advantage over what's already out there. Because if you don't, why are people gonna switch to something they don't know if it's not a better deal or a better product? Now, the second one I wanna talk about we call is called compatibility. So is this new product you're developing or this new innovation you're developing, is it compatible? Does it work with the environment you're gonna sell it in, okay? One of the reasons I feel that Sweden and Finland were so good in the mobile phone technology in the beginning, you know, in the 90s and 80s and stuff like that, was because in those markets, you had a huge country which was very sparsely populated in certain spots. So mobile phone technology really worked there because putting up one tower was a lot cheaper than running all those lines all over Lapland and stuff like that. And so it really kind of paid off. So if your product is coming out in a location where it works, it fits, it's gonna do much better. I mean, that's why if you look at some of the, like the, the North Faces and, 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 and Patagonia and stuff like that, you know, when they release these products, it fits into the market they're going for. Because if you're releasing, I mean, think about it. If I'm gonna release a Portuguese brand of winter clothing, probably not gonna work because Portugal is nice all year round or or Turks and Caicos winter wear. Well, this is Turks and, Co Turks and Caicos winter wear right here. It's not necessarily gonna work because it doesn't fit with that market. So you might wanna think about those things. Is it compatible? Now, the third one I'd say is if you look at it, we call it observability. Like, can people actually see the difference? Like, is it obvious? Again, going back to the DVD versus VHS tape or when it was, when uh, HDTVs came out versus the old standard televisions, you could really see it we could show people look you can see how much better it is look how crystal clear it is versus what you see before i know for me i remember I, they used to show a lot of sports when those hgtv shows came out i'm like oh my god 
I can see the hockey puck. I, I can follow the soccer ball really easily. It's so much easier to see things. It's so much clearer. If people can see that, it's gonna make it a lot easier for people to, to, to kind of go for that new innovation. Now that observability really follows into our fourth thing, and that is, trialability and complexity of the new innovation. Look, the more complex an innovation is, the more complex a new product is, the less likely it's gonna succeed. If I need to watch a 30 minute video to understand how this product works versus a 30 second video, the 30 second video one is going to do a lot better job and sell a lot more than that 30 minute one, okay? The more complex a product is, the more you're gonna have a tough time selling it, all right? That's why sometimes what's nice is you might look at what's called trialability. How easy is it for people to try out that product and so sometimes what you'll see my biggest thing if you're looking at food at like Costco or, or, or a Sam's Club or something like that or your local grocery store they'll have people there that are like here try this food they have free samples why do they have the free samples because then you can test the food out because how are you gonna get people to try out your new peep cereal or your new meatball version and stuff like that you're not going to they're not gonna spend the money so what you do is you let them try it for free here just try the meatballs I know for me I love when it's like mom's weekend or dad's weekend at Costco or Sam's Club when it's a university town because the parents take all the students to Costco and the students are like running in with their friends and trying every different snack that's there it's hilarious but it works I know for me I mean I never thought of having Sam's Club meatballs I'm like that's Walmart meatballs why would I why would I get that well the thing was I was at Sam's Club and the lady was there she was very nice she's like here try one I'm like I'm okay she's like just try it I'm like all right I'm like oh wow that was that was really good I had a couple more and then I bought a couple bags I'm like wow I would never have bought that unless I tried it out and that's one of the things you got to realize is if you have a product that can be tried out that will like convert people it's a lot easier to get them to go for it than just ta saying take my word for it those meatballs taste good okay so I hope that helps you know for the different ways that you can kind of have an idea if like some factors that might affect if a new product is going to be a success if uh, you want to learn more about marketing or new products or doing YouTube videos and stuff like that, please do click that subscription icon, do hit that notification bell, and you'll get our new business videos when we do put them out. Anyway, I wanna say thank you to all of you. Hope you click that like button and give us that thumbs up. Otherwise, I wish you good luck on your exams if you're studying, if you're a business person trying to figure out if you should go do a new product. I hope this helps you out as well, and we'll see you later in our next video. Bye from Turks and Caicos. Hi guys, Mark here with Walter's World, and we're at the Grand Canyon. As you can see it behind me, it is beautiful. Sorry about the wind, hope you'll be okay. And today we're gonna to talk about our first mover advantages and first mover disadvantages. So the pros and cons of being the first mover, first mover in an industry. Now, the good thing is, when you're the first mover, hey, you are the original brand. You set the standard. You're what everyone judges it against. Rollerblades, hey, any inline skates, it's judged against rollerblades. You see these kind of things. So that's a big, really big advantage. You are the industry. You are the standard, okay? Now, some other good stuff is if you're gonna come out the first mover, you can protect your IP. You're the first one to do it. Say, hey, look, I'm the first one, so it's mine. So I'm on iPhone, I get to have the rounded corner so you can protect your intellectual property. Also, it helps you gain quick market share. So if you're the first one out there, hey, I can grab it up when no one else is out there. You know, if you look at the, um, the Toyota Prius, you know, they were the first one out there, so they got this huge market share of the, of the you know, environmentally friendly cars, and then everyone else came. So they got that big initial market share to help them out. Some other advantages you have is one, if you're the first one out there, you're making the products first, so you can get these economies of scale, so you can you know, spread out your costs more. Also, you have the learning and curves effects. Because you're the first one to do it, you learn the mistakes first, and you learn from yourself. So, hey, you're farther down the production line, you've learned a lot more stuff of how things work, so that really does help and gives you a really big advantage. Another thing is you get to obtain strategic resources because you see your product needs certain stuff. Oh wait, we need to have all of the Angus beef out there to have these special Angus beef burgers. Well, you can buy up all the Angus cows, for example, or it might be, you know, chips for a computer or whatever. Okay, another thing you want to look at is you can develop an exclusive relationship with retailers, with suppliers, kind of goes into that getting the strategic, you know, getting the resources. You can develop those things so they're just working with you, not the other guy. So that's another big thing. Out there also by having those relationships you can get people locked in and once they're using yours hey I already bought a Nintendo why do I want to pay uh, for all those games again to buy a PlayStation you're the first one out there people have already locked into you so you're making it switching costs for suppliers for consumers to not use your product
And also, if you're the first one out there, you get to charge a price premium. I'm the first mover, I'm the first one out there. You're gonna do business with me first, so hey, you're willing to pay more for it because I was the innovator, I was the first one. So that gives you that gives you a, a bonus. And if you see the price premium, as more and more people come in, prices come down, the competition brings down the prices. So if you're the first mover, you can get that extra margin for a, for a period of time. And of course, you are one step ahead of the competition. You are the first mover, so you're the first one out there. So that that's there. So that's, that's the advantages. So there's some of the advantages out there. There are more, but those are some of the advantages. But what are some of the disadvantages? Well, one, it costs a lot of money to be first. You're the one out there spending the money, doing all those developmental costs. Also, the second movers, the late movers, they can learn from your mistakes. Okay. If, you know, Wendy's sees that McDonald's codfish burger was a disaster, they won't do it. They're like, hey, we, we learn from their mistakes. So people can learn from it. Also, if you're the first mover, the market might not be ready for it. So the product could fail. All right, so you, you gotta look at those things. Also, since you're the first one out there, you're doing something new, you're gonna have higher costs for the resources you use because people aren't making, it's not a standard product and standard supplies that they're giving to you to make this new product because you're the first one out there. So it's gonna cost more money. And another disadvantage is the co that your competition, they can backward engineer your product. Because if it's out there, they can see, how did they do this? How do they do this? They can play with it and figure out how to do it themselves and come up with their own version of the product to go around your patent protection, your IP protection. Also, if you're the first one in the market, people might have an idea, ah, this is what the first um, eye tracking software is going to be. This is what the first uh, stair climbing robot's going to be. They have expectations. And if you're the first one out there, you might disappoint them because you don't live up to those expectations. So you got to make sure you know the expectations of the clients are when you develop that product, when it comes out. Also, you might not get government approval. You know, you have to pass certain criteria, safety regulations, all these things, in order for your products to be sold. And hey, you know what? They might say, hey, we don't know if the dung beetle juice, even if you say it's healthy, we don't know if we want people to buy that. So you look at it, there might not be government approval, so that can be a problem. And then also, people might just not want to buy it, okay? It might be, hey, you know, it's too expensive to switch to this new product, or frankly, I'm happy with the product I'm in, and people might not just buy it, okay? So that gives you guys some of the pros and cons, or advantages and disadvantages of being a first mover. I hope this helps. If you want to learn more about business, please check us out on our website at www.waltersworld.com. Bye from the beautiful Grand Canyon in Arizona, USA. Bye. Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're gonna to talk about the industry life cycle. Sometimes when we talk about it, we talk about the product life cycle, and what we're looking for are the different stages in an industry from when it starts in its introduction to when it starts to grow and hits its maturity phase to when it eventually declines. And we're gonna go through each one of these steps to talk about, hey, what kind of strategies should we use? Where are we manufacturing? What's going on here so we can have the most success as a business at each one of those levels, okay? And so if we look at each of the, the stages, I like to talk about the introduction phase when it comes out, then the growth phase when things start going, right? The maturity phase when things kind of plateau, and then the decline phase when things kind of die off. The thing is though, in some models, they'll actually talk about product development. So there's no products being sold, we're just spending money developing it. I'm not gonna talk about that in this video. I'm just gonna focus on the when the products are actually being sold, okay? So the first stage we have is called the introduction stage, okay? This is when the products first come out. It's introduced, hence the name, right? And the thing is here is when you're in the introduction phase, you're coming out with something completely new, something completely different that people haven't seen before. So the strategy you're gonna use in this situation is a differentiation strategy. Hey, we're different, we're special, you should buy us over what was here before, right? And so if you think about it, if you think back when, I remember when, when HDTV came out and they would show like, oh, here's the HDTV, TV screen versus your old school TV. You're like, wow, that is way better. But the thing is, at first, those HD TVs didn't take off. Why? Well, there was no movies in HD. There was no TV in HD. What was the point of spending like an extra thousand dollars for a TV if it didn't do anything for you? And then you started having like the Tonight Show and sports started to be in HD. And then people could see, oh, this is why I should buy it. But then in the introduction phase, you have low sales numbers. You're not making much money. I mean, you've had all this development costs out there. Now you're not selling very much stuff. So therefore the prices tend to be the highest in the introduction phase. And you're gonna have a lot of costs in terms of distribution, and promotion. I mean, think about it. Your ads are just educating people what is an HD TV. You're not saying buy a Sony HD TV or buy a Samsung HD TV. You're just like, hey, dude, dudettes, 
Do you know what an HDTV is? Let me explain what high definition television is. And so, so much advertising spent just educating the market in this introduction phase that you really spend a lot just to, just to let people know what's going on. And the people that tend to buy at this time are innovators or affluent buyers because they have the money to pay those higher prices. And I kind of look at it this way. I mean, if you think back, think back to the very first time you saw an iPhone. You're, you're like the first time you saw one, you're like, oh wow, it's an iPhone, that is so cool. Like, let me see it, can I see it? Like it's something so new you've never seen before. Like, what does it do? How do I unlock it? It takes pictures and plays music? <laughs> Blew your mind, right? And that's what you have in this introduction phase. It's something so new and it's exciting for people. But over time, more and more people started to buy the iPhone. I mean, I know now everyone thinks, oh, everyone's had iPhones forever. Well, no, the iPhone 1, I mean, it sold well, but it didn't sell as well as some of the later models when people really were into buying those new iPhones. And so when you start having that growth, now you start taking off, now you hit the growth phase. And the thing is in this growth phase, we are still doing our differentiation strategy, or you might call it product innovation. We're coming up with new little things about it, right? Something that makes our thing a little bit nicer than the others. Oh, ours has a remote control. Ours has a special timer that goes off whenever you want. Oh, our phone does this. There's still some innovation there, but you're starting to have some more competition. Because of the growth phase, you've proved that this product or this industry is successful, and now the competition starts coming in. Now you're fighting more. So it's not just me educating my clients about what is HDTV, it's why you should buy a Sony HDTV. And the thing is, with that competition, that competition helps drive down prices, right? So there's, there's more competition out there. We got to have deals. We're trying to entice you to buy the Sony over the Samsung. And we start to have market standardization. You start having where everything's starting to like be more similar. I mean, think about it. After the iPhone 1 became really, really popular and it kind of became a standard, all of a sudden, all the other phones, I mean, let's be honest, you're, if you looked at your mobile phone right now, it looks basically the same as all the other phones, right? It's become standardized. It's a rectangle with a screen you touch. We're done. I mean, that's what they all are now. But that's what happens in the growth phase. You get that standardization. This is what we're all going to be doing. And the thing is, in this growth phase, more people are buying, but it's not like a guarantee people are actually buying. So this is kind of like when the iPhone 2 or 3 are out, and then people are like, hey, do you have an iPhone? Oh, you do? Can I get your number? Right? You like you have to ask them to see if they actually have it to do FaceTime or something like that. It wasn't a guarantee. And that leads us into the maturity phase. So the maturity phase, we start to hit this plateau. And in terms of sales, it's not growing like it was before because people aren't buying their first phone. It's not growth and new things. It's just people replacing their old phone, right? And so you wait a year, two or three to replace that phone. I mean, how long do your parents wait to get a new phone? How long do you wait to get to new, a new phone? You're not doing it all the time. And so therefore sales kind of plateau here. And with that, you start to see as there's a lot of suppliers out there, there's all this stuff that can happen to make it cheaper for those phone companies to lower their costs. And so that's where this process innovation comes in. You start to see more over capacity. You see people trying to fight and, and scratch and claw to to maintain their market share because you're like, look, I wanted to maintain my 30%. So your strategies kind of change a bit and you end up having sometimes what we call incremental innovations, just little things. I mean, that's what you're looking at now with, with mobile phones. They're at the maturity phase. People are just replacing their phones that they had before and it's a little bit better. The processor is a little bit better. The phone is a little bit better. The touch controls is a little bit better. The phone, the games are a little bit better, right? It's just these little changes you have and that's what you try to do to kind of spark new sales in this maturity phase. And there's gonna be other things you might look at. You might have what's called a market modifying strategy. And this is where you try to go out for a new market or you develop a new niche for your product. So maybe you're like, huh, what if we come, if we're McDonald's, maybe we come up with organic burgers. Yeah, they make veggie, they make organic. This could be something else we do to re-enliven sales, right? Like try to re-pop things up again. But again, it's gonna be a little bit, but you know, it's a little something you try to do. And so when we're modifying these things, it could be as something as simple, I mean, how many different variations of Coca-Cola do we have now? I mean, Coca-Cola, lime, lemon, orange, orange, vanilla, vanilla, cherry. I mean, it just goes on and on forever because they're doing these little tweaks, right? And sometimes it's not just the, the flavor kind of changes. Sometimes the packaging might change. So you might have one gallon of Coke or you might have those little tiny Coke cans. Yeah, they do that to try to figure out some way to get every little market they can. And then you have what's called the decline phase. And the decline phase usually starts when another product or another industry comes and kind of usurps that industry. So if you look at 
said in terms of VHS players, you know, they went off, they took off, it plateaued, and then the DVDs came and that died off. And then DVDs were going really well, and then streaming services came and they died off. And so you start to see, it's like, look, there's sometimes things that happen that come and really kill off a market. And the thing is, in the decline phase, you're sticking with process innovation, whoever can make it cheaper. You're seeing companies exit, like, look, we don't need to make DVDs players anymore. No one's just watching DVDs. We don't have to have that. We're going to focus on streaming stuff, or we're just going to make Blu-ray players and stuff like that. And so what the firms end up doing is they might harvest or sell off parts of their company that made products that are in the decline phase. And the thing is, is just because it's the decline phase doesn't mean you get rid of the product completely. What some companies do is they see it's a decline phase, but we'll have a little niche market. We'll just have this little niche, you know, the LP player. I mean, think about it. Albums made a comeback like 30 years after they thought we all thought they died, right? Like, wow, that was a whole new thing that came in that decline phase. How? How we found that new little niche out there for music lovers, right? But in general, what you're seeing is in the decline phase, lowest price wins. It becomes a commodity industry and it kind of goes through that and the thing is you'll see this in a lot of industries and it's really easy to see in technology because you see the technologies come through so much quicker but I just thought this would be a good thing to talk about and give you an idea of what to look for when you're looking at the industry life cycle or product life cycles so I wish you all the best and have a great day bye Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're going to talk about is why products fail. Because there's a lot of reasons why a product might fail, and we're going to go through a few of them and give you some examples of product failures that you think, why did that fail? I thought it would be a total success. And so we're going to talk about that. And one of the big things I see is one of those failures is really you overestimate the size of the market. When I talk to companies, they're like, oh, everybody could use this product. Everybody's going to want to have the old school Nintendo system. Um, maybe not. Maybe not everybody wants to play 8-bit games. Some people want to just sit there and play Fortnite all the time. I mean, I got my kids to play the old school Nintendo games for about 10 minutes before they go, Dad, can we play Minecraft? I'm like, Minecraft's got worse graphics than this. What are you talking about? They wanted to switch. So you might overestimate your market thinking that people really want to use it when it's not always there. I know in some places you might see overdevelopment. In the south of Spain, in the early 2000s, they had a huge building of retirement communities and, and villages for people, and they thought, oh, people are gonna move to Spain to retire, and they overestimate that size of the market. Not everybody moved from the UK and Germany to retire in Spain, and so that kind of failed. Another reason why you might see new products fail is sometimes it's just poor design. Look, if something looks like garbage, are you gonna buy it? I mean, think about it. If the food looks nasty, are you gonna buy that? Ooh, no, you gotta make it look good. That's why presentation is success. Now, the thing is, sometimes you'll see things that, that are you think will be successful, but there might be a part of the product design that is a failure. So for example, I'm, I'm really bashing on this Nintendo system because it took me forever to get it, but I got one. And the thing is, it comes with two controllers. The only problem is the controllers are about this far. They're about three feet. Now, how many of you like to play video games this close up? It, it, okay, maybe you do, but it looks really weird, okay? And when it's got really bad graphics, you wanna be farther away because then you don't notice how bad it is. Can't play it that way, right? So you gotta like play this when you try to you know, hold your things out. So a bad design can really ruin a product. Another thing you might look at is incorrect positioning. I mean, sometimes you sell something as a luxury good and it doesn't really work that way. Like this, if you sold the retro Nintendo entertainment system, oh, I'm selling as vintage. Go pack and play the games you played as a kid. If I sell it that way, it works really well. But if I position it as, hey, if you can't afford to get an Xbox, grab this. Yeah, if I'm going for an Xbox, like 1S, whatever, 19, I'm not really going back to the 8-bit stuff, right? So we might position it in the wrong way. So you want to make sure when you're developing your products, position it in a way that's really going to work. That's why when this Nintendo Entertainment System, the retro thing came out, it was retro gaming. Ah, great, right positioning for that. Also, when it came out, that was perfect timing. Another thing that can happen is sometimes products fail just because of bad timing. So for example, I was releasing a Walter's World Britain shirt in March of 2020. So how do you think Walter's World Travel Gear did in March, April, May, June of 2020? Bad timing, no one's traveling with COVID and the coronavirus. People are like, look, we're not going anywhere. And then all the travel stuff crashed. And so sometimes it's just bad timing. I mean, there's movies, I mean, think about Onward. I don't know if you ever saw the movie Onward. Fantastic movie, but it's the worst performing, you know, Pixar movie ever, or one of the worst ones ever. 
it's not a bad movie. It just it came out right before COVID, and so then they had to take it out of movie theaters. Sometimes it's just it's just timing. That's why it's important to look and see when is it going to be a success. Do I want to go up against a James Bond movie or another Pixar movie or something else? Your timing becomes important. Another thing you might look at is pricing. Sometimes you just have incorrect pricing. The price might be too high. Or it might be so low that people go, I don't know. I mean, a Mercedes for $20,000? Did it fall off the back of a truck or something? Like, I don't know about this. The pricing does matter on stuff in people's perspective. So you might price it wrong. Another thing you might look at is ineffective promotion. If people don't know that the product's out there, does it even exist? You know, it's kind of like the, if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to hear it, does it make a sound? Well, yes, it makes a sound. And also, your product is still out there, but if people don't know it, it's not a success. I know for me, when my kids were little, every time the circus came to where I live, I would only find out about it when they were taking it down from the Sam's Club parking lot. I'm like, oh, why didn't I know? Ineffective promotion, okay? So that's why you make sure if you have something out there, get the word out to help it have a chance to succeed. Now, another thing that could make for a product failure is sometimes management influence. You know, the managers want things to succeed, but sometimes they might not have their fingers on the pulse of the clients. They just think this will work great. And there are tons of stories of products that failed and movies that failed because the executives got involved. Way back in the day, there was an old Spider-Man 3 movie that they said, oh, we've got Spider-Man and we'll put Venom in there, we'll put Salmon in there, we'll put a, another Green Goblin in there. Like, whoa, 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 dude, that's a lot of stuff in one movie, you know? And it was just too much. And so the management decisions, the management influence actually had it fail. So that can be an issue. Another thing you want to look at that could cause product failure is sometimes you have a successful product, but it just costs too much to get it started. And so those development costs just make it so, look, unless we sell a million units, we're not going to make money. So some movies have made half a billion dollars at the box office and they're still considered a failure. Why? Because like Justice League made half a billion worldwide, but it costs them probably half a billion to make with reshoots and marketing and all that. And you're like, oh, because failure, it really is like it's on a scale. You know, it's really relative to what you're going for because making $20 million in a movie that only cost $15,000 to make is a huge success. But making a half a billion dollars on a movie that costs you half a billion to make, ee, that can be a problem, okay? Now, another thing that might hurt you is sometimes your competition might come out. Like I remember before the iPad came out, there was a lot of different tablets out there and you had a lot of different options. And then the iPad came out and just wiped everybody out. They all failed. Like everybody failed, it was, it was amazing. Now you've seen there's all kinds of different tablets out there, but at the time, that competition was so much better, you had no choice. It's kind of like, you know, when, when Sega saw the PlayStations coming out, the PlayStation 2 and all this kind of stuff, they're like, look, we're out, we, we got no chance, we can't beat this competition. Sometimes you fail like that. I mean, you think about it in sports, you know, they call the Utah Jazz a failure because they could never beat the Bulls back in the day. And then they call, oh, LeBron, well, he was a failure because he lost all those championships, only won a few. It's like, dude, he still got there. He still was a success, but the competition, Golden State, you know, lost to them and stuff like that. It's hard to beat that kind of team, right? So sometimes, no matter how good your product is or how good your player is, sometimes the competition is just too much, okay? Now, LeBron went through and got a few championships, so good, you know, he's not a failure. But you, you see what I'm trying to say is sometimes there's things out of your control that will make your product fail. Now, uh, one thing you can do and try to eliminate a failure, but one thing I see is when you, there's no real difference between your product and an existing product. You know, it's like we have a Big Mac, you know, bun, burger, bun, burger, bun, right? So if you have another burger that lives bun, burger, bun, burger, bun, oh, it's their Big Mac. Well, the thing is, if I want a Big Mac, I'm gonna go to McDonald's for a Big Mac. I'm not gonna go someplace else to get that sandwich, right? It's kind of like if I want a Baconator from Wendy's, right? I go to Wendy's for a Baconator. I don't go to McDonald's for a bacon cheeseburger, or Hardee's, or Burger King. Well, I go there. I want cheese curds. Well, if I want cheese curds, I go to Culver's because that's where they are. Yes, yeah, other people have, have cheese curds, but it's not the same. You gotta make sure you're distinguishing yourself from your competition. If you don't do that, it's a ticket to failure. Another thing you might look at is sometimes the product is poorly made. I mean, how many of you, when you were kids, would you go to the dollar store with your pants, you'd get a toy there and it like would break the first day or the second day? You weren't too surprised. So you're not, you're like, you know what? Maybe I saved my couple bucks and, and we just keep saving up and then I get a toy that's gonna last longer, like from Hasbro or something like that, versus the dollar store things because it just doesn't have the quality in it. That can be a problem. That can be a ticket to failure. 
Other things you might look at is sometimes a product may fail because it doesn't deliver on the promises. How many of you have been up late at night and those infomercials come on? You too can gain the fantastic form. You too can have big muscles ha -ha! and lose weight and all this kind of stuff. And then you do it and you're like, I didn't lose weight. Ugh, it, it didn't work. Well, the thing is, if you see that your product isn't delivering, you got to make sure you have customer compliance, right? We talk about this in another video, but you got to make sure that customers understand what they need to do in order for this to be a success. That's why it's like, well, you've got to do our 90 day workout program and do our 90 day diet program. And then you'll see your ticket to success. They're doing that to help people understand it because otherwise people are like, look, I did all the exercise stuff, but I didn't, my body didn't change in that in those before and after videos. Oh, well you didn't do the diet as well. So sometimes you got to see is why isn't it delivering? And sometimes if you over promise on things, people are going to be upset. You can't promise this is the greatest movie ever and it's just okay. It's not going to go well. Like Star Wars can't be here. Star Wars always has to be here. Marvel movies always have to be here. People are expecting that. So even if it's a Marvel movie and it's only good, you're like, oh, what's wrong with that? Like it's got to be great. Okay. So you kind of think about those things. So another thing I want to look at is the price quality ratio. It's kind of like, you know, a product at McDonald's. If there's a burger that's expensive at McDonald's, like your mind sometimes like McDonald's, fancy burgers. It doesn't make sense. Why would I pay all that money for a burger at McDonald's when I can go to a, a bar and get a burger at that price? I, I'm kind of confused. And, and that's the thing is sometimes people have this perception. It's like, look, if you're going to charge me this much, I expect the quality to be up here. Or if your brand is perceived to be a cheap brand and you try to do something nicer, people don't always accept it right away. That's why you see some companies, it, they have a long-term brand strategy to build up the perception of their brand. So it actually, maybe not this year or next year, but you know what? We start offering slightly nicer products, slightly more expensive stuff. So over a three year, four year term, people are not really shocked if there's a higher priced burger at McDonald's or some other place. And also that goes to the quality level. When you walk into certain fast food joints, I'm like, look, when I go to Culver's and y'all know I love my Culver's, I walk in, it's clean, the place is nice. Like, how are you? They bring the food to my place. They offer stuff. Do you need some ketchup, and some stuff? You want a refill? They're so nice. So I don't mind paying more because I'm expecting to pay more with all that extra service. And so if you're not kind of aligning the price and the quality or the level of service and the price, these kind of differences, that might be a ticket to failure as well. And the thing is, there's lots of different reasons why companies can fail. These are just some of the ones that you know, I want to talk about. I mean, one thing you might look at is sometimes you just sell it in the wrong spot. You know, think about it. If you're coming with a high end, super high tech gadget, when it first comes out, if you sell it at Walmart and Aldi, do people really think high tech new wave inventions at Walmart and Aldi? Or are they thinking about, oh, that should be at Best Buy? Or if it's like a fancy new mobile phone, do you expect that at AT&T or Vodafone or, or T-Mobile, one of those fancy phone companies, right? You expect it there. So sometimes you just really have to look, you know, where are we going to sell it? Because you sell it the wrong spot, that can also be a ticket to failure. So these are just some ideas and some kind of thoughts I have and other things you'll see out there about why products fail. We actually have another video that talks about some famous product failures that you'll enjoy. So check out that video as well. But I wish you all the best and hopefully your new products don't fail and this video helped you understand some of the reasons why other ones did so yours don't. So I wish you all the best and I'll say bye. Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here and do you want to make products that are spectacular failures? Of course not. And how do you not make a failure? Well, you learn from other people's mistakes. And so today what we have for you are some of the most spectacular product failures that have ever happened, okay? And, and the first off, I think we need to start with the granddaddy of them all, the one that when you say its word, it signifies failure, and that is the Ford Edsel. Now, the Edsel came out in 1957, okay? And the idea was, this is the next great car. And so the idea is, the next great car it needs to be something completely different. Yeah, I know people like beautiful cars that run well, that look great and all this kind of stuff, but let's change all that. Let's make a car that people thought was super ugly and doesn't deliver on the expectations that we set out there for being the next great car from the Ford company. And the thing is, the Edsel only made it in production for four years and then they're like, yeah, this is a total failure. We got to get out of here. And from then on, if you ever call anything an Edsel, it means it's a total failure, okay? Now, that's from the 50s. That's a long time ago. What about more recent kind of stuff? Well, well how about this? What if I gave you a clear glass of bubbly liquid? You'd see it and think, oh, 7-Up, Sprite. It's going to be that citrus kind of stuff, maybe some bubble water. Now, imagine you take a drink of that. 
and it tastes like cola? Whoa. Well, guess what? In the early 90s, Pepsi came out with Crystal Pepsi. The idea was, is, hey, you know, if we make it look clear, it'll look healthier and people might like it. And so we could sell this kind of like a, a diet healthier version of cola. But let's be honest, when you drink a cola, you know you're not doing anything healthy to your body, okay? So the market for that is wrong. But also, you have to think about how people see your products. I mean, think about it. When you see a dark colored bubbly drink, you're like, oh, it's gonna taste like cola. Whereas if it's clear, you're like, oh, it's gonna taste like lemon limey probably. And people's minds just could not accept that, all right? So just, just know that it does have to line up. And so that was a complete failure. Though they've had a resurgence lately in kind of like the, the vintage market. So sometimes you can still find that Crystal Pepsi in the weird soda sections of some stores. And the thing is, I remember when it came out and how popular it was when it first happened. And this is where you gotta be careful because sometimes new products are huge at the beginning because they're like kind of a cool thing, cool new thing. But after a while, people realize that this, this just, just, just isn't for us. I remember at the end of Crystal Pepsi, they were literally giving away 12 packs. Like, oh, you bought a pack of gum have a 12 pack of Crystal Pepsi. I remember using it as a backstop for the door in my dorm room to keep the door open. And it sat there the whole year holding the door open. Now, our next failure, I mean, this one, you'd think it would be a great idea. I mean, who doesn't like yogurt in the morning? I'm here on South Beach and on Miami Beach and just enjoying the weather. I'm feeling healthy, being out in the cool breeze. And you know, a good morning yogurt really helps the body movement going and you feel healthy when you eat it, right? Well, what if we took that yogurt healthy feeling and put it in your shampoo? In the late 70s, Clairol came out with the Touch of Yogurt Shampoo, which had, you know, yogurtiness in the shampoo. And the thing is, is it sounds cool, like, oh, yogurt is healthy, it'll make my hair healthy. But in reality, people could not disassociate yogurt with breakfast stuff that smells horrible if you leave it out overnight with shampoo that's supposed to smell a different way. And the thing was, is apparently some people actually ate the shampoo because the smell, I mean, hey, at least it smells good, but yeah, yogurt, shampoo, people do not associate those things together. So you gotta be careful with that. And that kind of association problem might come up later in our list. Now, next on our list, you 90s kids might remember this. That's the Easy Squirt Heinz Ketchup. Remember when there was like purple Heinz ketchup and green Heinz ketchup and the, the, different, the different color schemes? Well, think about it. Think of Heinz, what are they thinking? Hmm, kids eat Play-Doh. Play-Doh is multiple colors. Let's come out with ketchup in multiple colors. Yes, it was popular at first, but turned out to be a big failure because the color purple is not appeasing to people. It's like, what's wrong with my hot dog? Especially when they had the mystery color kind. I mean, look, I'm already eating a hot dog. There's enough mystery in the hot dog itself. I don't need mystery in my ketchup. So that was another failure for, you know, from the early 2000s. Now, next on our list has to do with an adult beverage that decided to take the adult out of its beverage. So Coors is a, the banquet beer, right? And so Coors talks about, oh, the Rocky Mountain waters, the, the, the spring waters, everything that makes our beer so good. Well, what they did is they took the beer out of their beer and decided, you know what? Let's just sell Coors Rocky Mountain spring water. But the thing is, if you buy a Coors, you're buying a beer, not spring water. And now think about it. How many kids you think got in trouble for drinking Coors water? Like, hey kid, you can't drink beer. Oh look, it's Coors spring water. Look, people could not disassociate Coors with beer, so there could be some issues there. Now, my next failure is summarized in two words. Anal leakage. Yes, folks, we're talking about the wow chips. We're talking about Lay's healthy potato chips. We're gonna make it in a way that is better for you so you don't have all the icky stuff that comes along with potato chips. You can feel good about eating the whole bag of potato chips now. Hmm, seems like a good idea, but there's one problem. The Olestra fat substitute they used caused diarrhea in people. But you can't say diarrhea, so you gotta make it you know, sound fancy. <clears throat> May cause anal leakage. And there's nothing I want better with my lunch than a bag of food that causes anal leakage, right? So yeah, the wild chips didn't really last very long, okay? So, so something to think about. Remember, anal leakage is bad for products, okay? <laughs> Now, another, the next thing I'll do is, is the, 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 probably the example you learn in every marketing class, the biggest marketing new product failure out there, new Coke. So Coca-Cola, 
the world's most iconic brand, decided, you know what? This soda that's been doing great for like, you know, 100 years, we should totally change the flavor to try to get some of these Pepsi people to start drinking Coke. Now, we could make another version of Coke. Nah, let's change our old time recipe that everybody loves and that people drank with their grandparents on the front porch and tell them, forget you. Well, yeah, you think it's stupid, but they did do that. And New Coke was a disaster. I remember people protesting when New Coke came out. They're like, bring back our Coke, bring back our Coke. And what's crazy is New Coke was taken off the market after 70 days and they brought back Coca-Cola Classic. And that is probably the best like return Lazarus marketing thing ever is when they got rid of New Coke and brought back Co the normal Coke. But we couldn't call it old Coke. They came back with Coca-Cola Classic, which was a huge hit. And Coke has never looked back, though every marketing student ever goes through that new Coke case. And the big problem was is they didn't listen to their core customers. Now, the conspiracy people will say, oh, maybe Coke did this just as a marketing ploy. And I would hope they wouldn't spend all those millions of dollars or something like that. But, but that's another failure you really should know. Now, our next product failure is one that I think is important to really, really kind of appreciate what they were trying to do but it was destined to fail now i love cheetos you love cheetos i mean heck there's like even like a netflix movie or something gonna come out about the guy that made you know invented the uh these flaming hot cheetos but the thing is we love the little cheese like um uh, you get the little cheese particles on you there's a word for that i can't think of what it is but there's a word for the dust it's like uh, mm, you can't get enough right so people love cheetos they love cheetos dust and people love lip balm, right? I mean, I'm in the sun, I need to have some lip balm on so I don't get chapped lips. But what if I had Cheetos flavored lip balm? Yeah, no, no, no. Cheetos is a snack. What is the core of the product? Cheetos is a snack. Lip balm is something you don't eat. Though many toddlers probably think they need to eat it. No, it is a lipstick kind of thing. It's a chapstick. You do not <laughs> mix those things together. And that goes back into putting two totally different types of products together that don't relate, okay? So Cheetos Lip Balm, early 2000s, did not quite make it. But you can still find, I'm sure if you go on eBay, you might find some old stuff. I wouldn't, I wouldn't get it, but it's out there. I mean, come on, it's Cheetos and Lip Balm. I can understand what they were thinking. Now, my next product failure I wanna talk about is from Colgate. You know, Colgate, the company that makes your toothbrushes and, and your toothpaste and maybe get some dental floss from it or something like that, you know? Colgate, right? And the thing is, Colgate, I think they decided, you know what? We need to backwards integrate into people's daily lives because you finish off your day brushing your teeth before you go to bed. But what's the thing you do before that? You have dinner. And Colgate came out with kitchen entrees. Like seriously, they had meals. Imagine Colgate meals. I don't know about that. That seems a little strange. Like my toothpaste is making food for me. Maybe they should have gone with a different brand name than Colgate with that one because nobody associates Colgate equals Salisbury Steak Day. Now, you gotta think about what your brand really means and that's why some companies, when they develop new products, they will actually come up with a new brand name to sell it under that. Now, next on our list, this is another one of those great ideas. Hey, let's make a less good product than our competitor and charge more for getting the stuff you want on it. Hello to Microsoft Zune. Okay, so the Zune, remember, you know, your, your phone now plays all your music and plays all your stuff, but back in the day, you needed an iPod to play your music, right? And so you would have all your music on here and, and listen and stuff. And, and Microsoft wanted to get in on that. Like, hey, we'll come up with our own stuff where Microsoft will be a success. And so they came out with the Microsoft Zune. And it came out and it didn't look anywhere near as cool as the iPods. And, and they actually charged like 50% more for the songs on there. And people were like, you know, you're not really cool, and and why would I pay an extra 50 cents for a Madonna song or a R.E.M. song or whatever? It's back in the day. You know, like, why would I pay 50 cents more for the same song when I can listen on the iPod for less? And it was a disaster. They actually stopped making it after they lost over $3 billion in a couple years, okay? So, didn't quite work out. Now, my next product failure I want to talk about is another one that I like to share with my, my students and you can look up the ads online and that is the McDonald's Arch Deluxe. This is a problem where it was you got to realize who you are and when you think McDonald's you think we are the value menu. We are the cheap fast food place for people. Well the thing is McDonald's wanted to change their image and make them seem more adult, more fancy so we would come out with a fancy burger. 
Look, if I want a fancy burger, I'll go to like Culver's or a bar or someplace that has like fancier burgers. I go to McDonald's because it's cheap and it's fast and it's standardized. And what happened is they actually spent over a hundred million dollars on ads to get the Arch Deluxe out there and to get people excited by it. But it ended up hurting them overall because they started advertising all this more expensive food. And if you're thinking, wait, is McDonald's expensive now? And they had to like advertise, hey, we got a discount on the Big Mac to bring people back. So remember, you know, who are you, right? If you're McDonald's, look, you're cheap, you're fast, you're standardized. That's, that is who we are. You go out of that lane, you can get into trouble, all right? So there was a failure there. Another one, which takes me back to my childhood, is the Betamax. Now, the Betamax versus VHS tapes, that's when, when I was a kid, that's how you'd watch the Disney movies, right? You put the, the tape in and, and watch there versus streaming now. But Betamax actually versus VHS, Betamax had higher quality video, higher quality audio. It should have won the war versus VHS. But just like when you're a toddler, if you don't share, you get in trouble. And Sony did not share the technology for the Betamax. They said, I could do it myself. Just like every toddler and every parent will tell you when the toddler says, I could do it myself, a disaster follows. And that's what happened. JVC, which had the VHS system, they licensed that stuff out and anybody could make it. And that's why we all had VHS tapes and Betamax, though it had better quality, did not go as far, okay? And it, and it did collapse. And my last one I wanna talk about is a product that was so lit, or they tried to make it so lit that it burst into flames. And that is the Samsung Galaxy Note 7. Back in 2016, Samsung came out with a phone, you know, a, a Galaxy Note, like bigger than a phone, and it was a popular model, like it came out, but there was a problem. It would occasionally overheat and burst into flames. I remember flying around Europe and we would get on the planes and they're like, if you have a Galaxy S Note 7, please you know, let a flight attendant know and get it off the plane. You couldn't take it on a plane. I'm like, it's your business travels. The business travels can't travel with it because it bursts into flame. Yeah, if your product bursts into flames, like the hoverboard stuff, you don't want to have that, okay? So do be careful with that because major issues like that, yeah, I can pretty much signify that that product is not going to be a success. So what are some other huge product failures that you've seen over the years? Put it down in the comments section below so people can learn from other people's mistakes and we can have more successful businesses. Anyway, I'll say bye from here on South Beach in Miami Beach. I wish you all a great day. Bye.